Welcome, everybody. We are now going to start my favorite part of the evening, the mixology session. So be before we begin, I just want to um, I just want to just remind you of a few things. I know all of you have been to uh, many uh, virtual sessions uh, over the last many months, but let me um, just remind you of a few things. Um, the first thing is this uh, tonight is going to be recorded. So, and it is going to be available for download uh, in the future. Uh, second, second of all, um, when you aren't speaking, please could you put your microphones on mute? And third, um, which I'm probably sure you've done is please make sure uh, you adjust your Zoom settings so we can uh, identify you when you are speaking and everybody else can identify you. So um, to start out, um, I'd like to just give a big shout out to uh, our Big Shift sponsor, uh, which is uh, EarthX and Trammell Crow. Uh, not, our, not only are we privileged to have them here tonight, um, as well as we're going to learn about their leadership story in the environmental sector. And so uh, we'll be hearing from them uh, later on tonight. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like you to join us in celebrating the seventh annual Leaders in Energy Award. Next slide. Beth. Next slide. Hi, Marty. Hi, um, next slide. There we go. I am most thrilled and honored uh, to present um, John Shope, uh, my new drinking buddy and the sales manager of Concocton Creek, sorry, Concocton Creek Distillery. Um, he is going to be our mixologist for the night. And I'm um, just very excited for him to be joining us uh, tonight. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about um, the distillery. Uh, first of all, the um, Concocton Distillery uh, was formed in 2009 by Scott and Becky Harris. Uh, Scott is a software engineer and Becky was a chemical engineer. And um, Becky uh, is one of the few women industry owners of distilleries that um, is not only both an owner, but she is also the chief distiller um, for her distillery. Um, one of the reasons why they formed the um, distillery is because they wanted to tell the history of whiskey I, uh, uh, um, in Virginia, as well as using um, uh, modern day equipment. And so what's exciting about this distillery is, is that they practice sustainable practices. They have a 41 um, make, I'm sorry, 41 kilowatt system on their roof. And that um, produces about 85% of their electricity on a daily basis. This is equivalent to about uh, five residential homes. They also uh, have uh, zero waste production from beginning to end. Um, 
all of their uh, rye that they use is from is um, locally based. Um, so what, what we're very fortunate to have is John Chope here tonight to, um, to talk us through two drinks. One of them is the 50 Shades of Green, as well as an old fashioned Shenandoah. So I'm gonna pass it over to John. John, we have just um, asked to unmute you. So if you could go ahead and do that, we'll bear with you. Hey, can you guys hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Thank you so much. Hi. How are y'all doing? Sorry, guys. Listen, my name is John Shope, and thank you very much for letting me uh, participate in this award show. This is something that is really tied in. Like they said, we do have 128 solar panels on our rooftop. And we, uh, on a very sunny day, are able to generate enough electricity to put right back in Dominion. I represent the state of Virginia for the company, and I wanted to share with you a couple of cocktails. So we're gonna get right into that, starting off with our 50 Shades of Green, okay? For those who are able to purchase and join us, we're gonna start off with Watershed Gin. I like to call the Spock Whiskey, solar powered organic certified kosher. Drink Ryan Prosper. This is a gin that is rye based. We lower the juniper content that you find in traditional ryes, but we gas up other classic ingredients like cinnamon, coriander, orange peel, star anise, and a handful of other proprietary botanicals, making a year round gin that's really delicious even by itself. This cocktail, we wanted to get a nice green colored cocktail. See, I got my shirt, bandana hat for you guys. We're green on green today. So listen, if you got a tin shaker, let's go ahead and fill it up with ice. Now forgive me, I hit the ice over here. I thought it was an obnoxious little uh, vessel. Here we go. So I got a tin shaker, full of ice. We're gonna do about one and a half ounces. Now we are in a tasting room, so our Core spouts are measured, so I'm gonna do a little dog and pony show just to make sure I get up to that one and a half ounces for you, okay? Now, that's our watershed gin. What I made here is a matcha syrup, okay? Look at that, man. Look how earthy and green that is. <laughs> Look, you take a matcha powder, all right? And you follow the instructions. This one called to do a teaspoon of matcha powder to 12 ounces of hot water. And that's to make your matcha. But what I did is I did equal parts water to sugar to make a syrup, and then added that teaspoon of matcha into it to make this matcha simple syrup. So the beauty about that, antioxidants, but also a little bit of a natural caffeine boost. So this is a great brunch cocktail. This is a great afternoon cocktail. It's gonna keep you guys going. So I'm gonna do about an ounce of that matcha syrup, okay? Now, I'm not a fan of those things. We're using natural ones here, guys, all right? Oh, here's a trick for you, by the way. For anybody who's using these presses, some people, because it fits this way, they're like, this makes sense. You put it this way. This way you get all the juice pressed out. Okay, now watch, I'm gonna do two ounces of fresh lime juice for this cocktail. Okay. Put that in here. And I'm gonna start to shake this. 
we're using citrus, and when you're using citrus, guys, you always shake the cocktail. Okay, this is how you're gonna get a nice viscous uh, mouthfeel. You're gonna get that nice frothy kind of color uh, top to it. And whenever you shake a cocktail, you smile. Okay, we're gonna take this cocktail. We're gonna fine strain it. I like to use a Nick and Nora glass. These are these pretty little glasses right here. You can also use a coupe glass or a small martini glass. Look at this color, guys. Whoa. And then me personally. Great. This is called Icky Bitters. This is by DC and Bitterman. Now, what's cool about this, it's very complimentary to the matcha. Icky is a Japanese style bitters. Listen to some of the stuff that's in this. We got a little bit of a wasabi, ginger, green tea, seaweed, sesame seeds, shiitake mushroom, ginseng. How cool is that? You can buy this at our distillery. You can actually have it shipped to your house via katatacreekstore.com. DC and Bitterment also has its own website, Modern Bar Cart. I'm gonna do about, I'm doing six dashes. I wanna be able to smell it. A lot of people are nervous about bitters. They're gonna make the drink too bitter. Not with these, these are very aromatic. You wanna be able to smell them and taste them. Next time John, will you have this recipe on, on your website? We have it on the website. And we're oh, gonna wonderful. And we've also shared it with everybody uh, with, new, uh, with New Energy. Yeah, Candace, um, this is Janine. We sent it out in our newsletter this week. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, yeah, maybe take a look at that. And that newsletter is posted on our website as well under news. Look at, look at that drink. Oh my gosh, that looks fabulous. Woohoo! wow. Green drink, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We wish with. we were there with you, John. <laughs> you want to drink it with me? Sure, right? but I've got right? lemonade on my end. <laughs> Very cool. Right. Um, applause. <laughs> 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 I got a crowd out here. <laughs> Very refreshing drink. I tell you what, this is definitely something you can enjoy on a patio. You can enjoy it on a, on a, on a, on a cold night. Give yourself a little bit of that zip from that caffeine and those antioxidants. Um, and like I said, it's also like almost like a hangover, like a, like a corpse reviver or something like that. You could really enjoy this after like a long night, a great morning, hot, all green machine for you guys. That's wonderful. Now we did talk about, well, I don't want to drink alcohol, right? We got a couple of people who want to do mocktails. So I got a trick for you. Real easy. No booze, okay? Instead, we're gonna just continue with the syrup. Continue with the citrus. Now, our bitters that I'm using do have alcohol in them, okay? So if you're like, I mean, we're talking about drops of alcohol, guys, but if you are really trying to go 100%, non-alcoholic there's a company called fee brothers they do glycerin based bitters you can find them in a lot of stores you can find them online and you can take that exact same kind of a uh, vibe now, they don't have japanese bitters but you can get like some aromatic bitters or some rhubarb bitters some lime bitters be really really nice with this i am okay with just a couple of drops in my mocktail so I'm just gonna put a couple of drops in here and I'll show you guys. Once again, because you're working with citrus, you want that frothy top. And basically, oh. Use like a, a taller, a taller glass. I'm using a small high bowl here. But you could probably use like a half pint glass, tall rocks glass. Fill it up, exact same thing. Now the only trick here, the difference here is instead of using booze, right? We are now going to top it up with a club soda or a mineral water. I have a lime LaCroix that I was using for lunch today. I forgot to drink it. But look, look at that. That's just gonna add more of that lime flavor anyway. Now, 
These are, and I know we're, we're not big on straws out here. These are biodegradable. Bam. And same thing. Mocktail, you're going to garnish with wine wheel, mint sprig, and then you serve it. That looks beautiful, John. Just nice. as beautiful as the other one. Yeah. Nice. Very refreshing. And so you can manipulate the amount of syrup you use too, because it can get, um, you want to control your sweetness. I did an ounce there. You could do three quarters. You want it really sweet. You could do one and a half. And, and you, and you sell that stuff that's in the jar right there, out there. Say again? You sell the um, green um, stuff that's in the um, jar that you just set down, that. Yeah, do you sell that out there at Catoctin? We do, we do not. This is very easy. Call it simple syrup for a reason. Matcha. Oh, that's matcha. right. Okay, okay, thank you. Equal parts water to sugar, and then you add your matcha powder. This will last up to three weeks, okay? I made this about a week ago. Look at this, and it still has so much flavor. Look how dark green that is. It's really earthy. Right, okay, thank you. you. Use outside of your cocktails, which, I mean, honestly, you can even just use it as a booster shot in the morning if you add a little pinch of salt, maybe another squirt of lime juice so you get your electrolytes. You can pour this over ice cream. There's a lot of different things you can do with that. You can put it in wow. cakes, baking. It's a very tasty cocktail. And now, John, where did you say you got the matcha powder? Was that at Mom's Organic Market or? Mom's Organic Ma Market. We bought this one, I believe, at Whole Foods. Um, you can get it at Fresh Market. And honestly, um, even a lot of those like supplement stores that sell like vitamins and, and, and those type of things, you could probably find it there as well. Um, shoot, I think I've even seen some matcha powders in like, like local CBSs and Harris Teeters. Like you can, you can, you can find it in your store. But uh, look for the organic stores in particular, because that's, I mean, that's where I got my, I mean, look, it's, a, it's an organic matcha. I got mine at Whole Foods, but uh, Mom's Organic Market, for sure, Fresh Market, all, all those different stores. And then, hey, John, do they have any in smaller containers? I mean, so you can kind of check it out and see if you really like it, because that's pretty big. 100%. There's also um, pre-made versions, though I find that those are going to be really thin, and you're going to have to add that sugar after the fact, thank you for saying Trader Joe's. That's absolutely right. Trader Joe's is another one. Um, so you can actually even just get like something that's about this size. That's just like a matcha uh, in a bottle, not a can. Uh, but I would highly recommend finding the powders. And uh, yeah, we, we definitely got a larger one. You can definitely get different sizes. That's not the only size available. <laughs> Great, thank you, John. You're very, very welcome. Now, when we made Fifty Shades of Green, that was like, <laughs> Because originally when we talked about this, this is all about, you know, sustainability, all natural, local, right? And I made a green cocktail, right? My cocktail used all local, fair trade, organic, family-owned ingredients, right? And it was not green at all. Um, what time will we open these days? So we're open our regular hours, traditionally uh, uh, Tuesday to Sunday. Um, we're talking about... 12 to 5 on most days. And then on the weekends, we also, here, I'm going to do this. See, I no longer work in the tasting room, right? A bam. Screenshot that if you can get the small print. But I'll tell you right now, we are open Tuesday to Thursday, 1 to 5. Friday, 1 to 7. Saturday, 12 to 7. Sunday, 1 to 6. We're located at 120 West Main Street, Percival, which is in Loudoun County. And it's a delightful trip out there. Um, Marty, you can chime in on this too. Um, we took a little field trip. You know, we had to check this out. <laughs> and we yeah. had a lot of fun. It was a beautiful fall day. When did we go? Uh, late October, I think it was, John. Actually, we went to celebrate my birthday. Oh, yeah. So, so what day was that, Marty? That was, oh, well, you that was November 5th, I think. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, but it was such a great day. We had an awesome time with John. Got to know the distillery and actually spent a little too much money there, but uh, we had a great time. Well, you're giving that all the way for the door prizes, right, Marty? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm drinking my drink now. Guys, we, um, so when we made that green, so at first the cocktail I made was a green, all natural cocktail. It was not the color green. 
And they were like, no, 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 we want a green colored drink. And that's where I was like, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and, and so I went with the matcha. Uh, actually, this young lady back here who's hiding, she's working, that's Denise right. Petty. She's our taster room manager. She was like, John, I got an answer for you. And she gave me a cocktail that I riffed on by adding lime juice and changing it up a little bit um, to make the 50 Shades of Green. But I made an all natural cocktail, which is the next one we're gonna show you, which is a Shenandoah Old Fashioned, okay? So, okay, John, we got about eight minutes for that. I can fly through it, watch what I do. You're gonna love what I do next. But uh, yeah, I mean, we don't wanna rush you, but uh, just kind of oh. letting you know time-wise. Shake it with ice. This cocktail calls for quarter branch apple brandy. This is an 80 proof, not sweet, an Appalachian style apple brandy, Virginia staple. And you got a story behind that too, don't you, on that apple yes, brandy? We'll be cidery out of uh, Richmond. And that's owned by Courtney. Uh, I always forget her last name. God forgive me, Courtney. Uh, forgive me on that. But, it, but that's a woman-owned, woman-operated cidery in collaboration with a woman-owned, woman-operated distillery making this awesome colonial-style apple brandy. So it drinks the way like a cognac or a Calvados does. It's 80 proof. It's not sweet. And I got two ounces of that. It's got a nice little fleshy red apple, but this is going to be an old-fashioned riff here, guys. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Um, and we're going to do another. And see, here's what's really cool. So this is a cranberry orange syrup by Pratt Standard. A young oh, that's delicious, John. I bought that when I was out there. Yeah. Uh, so this is Tori Pratt, another young lady outside of D.C., woman-owned, fair trade, organic syrups. She's used a fresh cranberry and orange to make this. So did you hear what I just said? Woman-owned operated cidery, woman-owned operated distillery, woman-owned operated syrups. Nice. Oh, and then my buddy, uh, <laughs> Eric Koslick. But in collaboration with my young lady friend here, Lisa Teddy, boom, we create <laughs> five bitters. Everything has had a woman's touch to this cocktail. I'm gonna add I don't, want to, I don't want to get too heavy. Yep, half ounce syrup of this cranberry orange. Hey, John, does that syrup taste good over ice cream? Have you ever tried that? I tried it over ice cream, and I'll tell you what, holy smokes, super good. Oh, really? Over toast? You can mix it over, you can mix it with butter and like use it to like do French toast, and uh, you can Ooh. actually use it in marinade. You can, you can use it in, in baking. There's, you can actually just mix it with club soda by itself to make a cranberry on soda. Uh, sort of like a Shirley Temple, but uh, a little bit of a full twist there. Very, very delicious. Now, the difference between this cocktail and the other one, there is no citrus involved. So I am actually just going to stir the cocktail because when you stir liquor, or when you shake liquor, this is when you uh, add viscosity to the liquor and it actually crystallizes and makes a cloudy looking beverage. By stirring it, we're gonna have a nice clean looking drink. I'm just waiting until my shaker gets cold. It's an old fashioned. So what I like to use is a rocks glass. You see this big ice cube I just put in there? Look at that. And then what I'm gonna do is fine strain that into here. Look at this color, guys. Look at that color. Our round stone bitters, which uh, again, collaborated with Denise Petty to make. This is, hey, there she is. <laughs> All Virginia, mostly Virginia, from the white dog we used to make our whiskey. We add honeysuckle, we add uh, uh, Virginia rose and gentian. And see how many bitters, I'm really open-minded about my bitters, guys. Use your bitters. Chicory, yeah, Virginia chicory. There's a little juniper in there. Throwing some cranberries in here. I've got a little orange <laughs> zest. Very different. So look, I'm gonna rub it around the glass. See what I'm doing here? I'm rubbing it around the rim of the glass. I want the oils to Stick to that, and then I'm going to twist this to allow some of those oils to expel into the drink, which you can then put in if you would like. Just to give you a little bit more flair here today, I'm going to put a little wheel in here to give you. Wow, that is fancy. <laughs> and just oh, one, it's it's warming. It's 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 a little sweet. It's apple. It's cranberry. It's citrus, it's fall. This is such a beautiful little grape. 
You can make these ambassadors for friends, guys. And then as far as like doing the mocktail version, which like I said, I'll power through. I don't even have to use the shaker for it. We're gonna omit the brandy and instead we're gonna focus on our syrup, right? Those Fee Brother company I told you, if you guys are looking to do the mocktail without any booze at all, um, I am a, I'm a hoop. <laughs> Got my syrup. I'm going to do a little soda once again. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate your love and support out here. This is this is great. So, so can, we, can we order mocktails when we come out there? We don't <laughs> have to. Oh, sure. <laughs> You most certainly can. We'll happily look. I mean, we have a, a lot of young people that come out here, families that bring their children, and we always say, uh, you know, they want to have a little uh, soda with some of our syrups or our honeys or our maple syrups. We will very happily do that. Very happily do that. Okay, great. And again, you can use these bitters. Otherwise, Fee Brothers does make a cranberry bitters, which is a fun addition to this drink if you're trying to do a glycerin-based non-alcoholic version. Once again, biodegradable straw. And you have basically big kid soda right here. Oh, man. And Ooh, very good. Very good. And you can control how much syrup you put in that, guys, so that you can have it as sweet or as rich as you want it to be. And what do you call that one? The, the mocktail? I, since this is the, <laughs> since this is a mocktail, we're going to call this the Shenandoah Old Fashioned. Shenandoah. No, 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 and Noah old-fashioned. No, no, it's, <laughs> it's just a very tasty uh, cranberry orange spritzer. And, uh, and you can share this with just about anybody who wants to get in on it. And of course, spike it with a little booze and it's ready to go too. <laughs> oh. Oh. Do, I know that we are on a tight, well, we got like five minutes left. Does anybody have any questions about the distillery, about me, about the cocktails, any recommendations? What do you guys want? Hey, John, how about that barbecue place? That's, is that a good, um, I enjoyed that, the Monk's Barbecue that's just up the road. The Shenandoah re recipe will be on the website. I will confirm that both of these cocktails get put up on the recipe. Um, we did share both of these cocktail recipes with New Energy, which they have shared. And I will, I will make sure that we have all the information available to you so that you guys can recreate these at home. Uh, Janine, you were talking about Monk's Barbecue, which is down the street. Um, yeah, oh yeah, guys, listen, and, and we are doing social distancing. We, we are trying to be as careful as possible out here. Um, but when you're comfortable, we are here and we are serving and we are ready for you. But Monk's Barbecue is about, it's, it's a walking distance down the street from where we are. It is arguably, we have a small outdoor area. I see that, Ann. We, we have a small outdoor patio area. And uh, it's a couple of barrels with seats around them, and they probably how many, how many seats you got out there? We have about three or four. Um, we love it. I, I, I can't wait to see you guys. But Janine was talking about Monk's Barbecue, which is right down the street, and I would argue. I used to represent the state of North Carolina for this company. I have been around. I have seen uh, barbecue in all of North Carolina, the whole area. Louisville, Kentucky uh, for work and uh, all other kinds of places. But I'm telling you right now here in Northern Virginia, Monk's Barbecue, we, we got something that is super, you guys make the most amazing barbecue and, and have to come up here and check it out. So when you come up to our distillery, um, plan, they're closed on Mondays, but plan to come out here and go to Monk's afterwards, okay? And we're closed on Mondays too, by the way, to the public. We're hey, John, working. you're one of the top 10, and we should give a little plug to Sloppy Mamas, because that's how you and I met through your friend, Joe Newman. Um, what yeah, a coincidence that was. You know, my husband and I just stopped by this barbecue place in Arlington. Uh, you were doing a tasting there, you know, your yeah. uh, company. And I was telling the owner about Leaders in Energy, how we're doing a gala event. And he said, oh, they have a solar powered mm -hmm. distillery. You might want to, you know, get a hold of them. And then that's how you and I met. I and I'm not even a big barbecue person, is why my husband had wanted to do the barbecue thing. <laughs> Can I, so I went and visited Joe on Thursday. 
no, no, that was yesterday, the day before, uh, to drop off a couple of hats and shirts. And he was like, hey, man, you want to take some barbecue with you to go home to feed the family? And he gave me a smorgasbord. I've been eating barbecue from sloppy mamas <laughs> for like three days. Uh, ribs, brisket, whole pork, the whole nine yards, a bunch of cornbread and biscuits. Wow. That is sensational. They make a to-go. It's not the cranberry orange. He makes his own syrup, but he makes a version of this to go using our 92 proof brownstone rye uh, that you can actually purchase to bring to your house and you just pour it over ice. And you either have two nice old fashions or one incredibly large old fashioned, depending on what kind of night you're having. <laughs> and uh, I highly recommend going over to Sloppy Mama's Sweet People Great Food. Hey, Amen. John. Well, thank you to Joe and um, Marty. How are we? Are we? Uh... About ready to say a Riva Durche here? We are, but quick question. Aren't you able, we're able to see the power production, right? On this on the website. Yeah, if you right? go to our website, there's a button that says solar power. You can actually watch in real time our output that we're awesome. doing 24 hours a day. You can see it in live real time. Right. Waste free site. Everything we use gets used in some capacity. We're supporting local farmers, local bartenders, local restaurants, and chefs for yeah. everything. Nothing gets nothing gets wasted. We have cleaning products coming off the run that we use to clean the building, the whole thing. We yeah. would love to see you guys out here. Yeah, we just had an amazing time and we went uh, met with you. So thanks so much. Thank Cheers. you, John. John. Thank you so Thank you so much. That is awesome. Yeah, probably about zero percent right now. I'm not able to see it right in this moment, but you're absolutely right. I'm imagining it's very dark and a little rainy and probably not outputting a lot of stuff right now but come and see us come and see it in real time yeah it's great marty thank you so much Jeanine, thank you thank you john thanks john i love you guys and i'll see you soon okay talk to you soon talk to you soon all right well that's john my, like i said he's my new best drinking buddy so love him so much and now to our next part of our, uh, our celebration, I'd like to introduce um, our master of ceremony, Samuel Serafel. Um, he is an advisor to uh, leaders in energy. Uh, he is the founder of, of a company called Manza Collapsa. And um, what this company does is that he support, supports early stage startup companies. Um, and he's just a great person to talk with about um, this area of expertise that he is, has. And so let's give him a round of applause. Thanks, Marty. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That, uh, that tour and those mixology drinks, they got me thirsty. I, I was starting them on my way over there, but then I remembered, oh, we have an event tonight. So, but welcome everybody. <laughs> welcome, e mm -hmm. welcome everybody to the seventh annual uh, Four Generations of Leaders in Clean Energy and Sustainable Solutions uh, Award Celebration. Uh, glad to have everyone here. Uh, remember, if you're on social media, we're gonna talk about it a little bit more, but the hashtag is LE4Gen. Um, one element that Marty didn't mention, make sure everyone in the room is seated six feet apart to respect social distancing, uh, to do that. So the theme for this, for this uh, award will be regenerating for a positive future. We have an exciting program uh, for you today, full of celebration, new connections, and much, much more to uh, bring in the big green shift. Before we get started, we want to do a special acknowledgement to uh, all of the indigenous communities in whatever city you're logging in from. Uh, these communities are protecting up to 80% of the biodiverse regions on earth. So we wanna make sure we, we, we support whatever cause that they're, that they're working on. Um, so tonight's schedule, we have it packed to, to celebrate all of our awardees. We've been through the online socializing. You've got a chance to meet uh, and greet some of our fellow uh, attendees. Uh, we've gotten this mixology sort of demonstration from the great group. And now we're gonna move into our awards program after which we'll do some uh, door prizes and creative sustainability action photos. 
and then sort of transition into more networking and small group discussions. And so next up, we're gonna show a brief video about our major sponsor, EarthX. Thanks, that's fantastic. We're so uh, delighted um, that today we're joined by both uh, Tremel Crow, founder of EarthX, as well as Lynn McBee, uh, board chair for EarthX, just to talk a little bit about Lynn before uh, she's able to join us virtually on the stage here. Um, Lynn McBee is a proud Texan with a lifelong love of science and nature that began as a child collecting bugs, climbing trees and playing in surf uh, along the Texas beaches. Uh, it's a passion she's carried throughout her life, pursuing a career in science and engineering and after graduating from the University of Texas with a degree in biochemistry and working 25 years as a research scientist at New England Biolabs, the world leader in genomic research. She started as a scientist and today advises on partnership development and serves as a company manager and employee owner. She'll be introducing uh, Tremel S. Crow, founder. He's the founder of EarthX, formerly no known as Earth Day Texas, the largest annual exhibition and forum showcasing the latest initiative, discoveries, research innovations, and policies, corporate practices serving to reshape the future. So please join me in welcoming uh, Tremel S. Crow and Lynn McBee. Thank you so much. And it's an honor to be here tonight. And I want to just take a minute to really acknowledge my friend Trammell Crow, the visionary and the leader behind EarthX. EarthX has celebrated its 10th anniversary recently. And we've had an enormous amount of engagement globally, internationally, and we're really proud to be part of tonight's celebration. To do Trammell's whole bio and resume would go very long. And so I just want everyone and to- And can't be told and, here. And can't be told here. <laughs> so it's been an honor to work alongside Trammell for these last months as we pivot and go into EarthX TV. What? Well, You're up. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Samuel Trammell EC, nice to meet you. Uh, thanks for being, we're glad to be associated with all of you all. Uh, we're in the same boat as everybody here this very unusual year. Our event, we canceled in a March for the April, April 22 Earth Day uh, and have gone virtual. But one of the blessings ironically of COVID is you learn so much and we've learned that EarthX TV website and social media is our future and hope to be covering many more things with you all in the future. Well, tonight is all about honoring some amazing leaders from many different generations. And so I, it's really my pleasure to honor them. And I'll, I'll let uh, Trammell help me read names of all the distinguished people we're going to honor tonight. Moi? Moi. <laughs> uh, Dr. Klaus Lochner, my friend at ASU. And that's for his focused work on closing the carbon cycle. And we were amazed to read that he, he uh, is the first man to have come up with, in this context, the idea of capturing uh, carbon from the air, geoengineering. And then Tanya Graham. For her work to help communities become more climate resilient. Akanksha Khatri. For work to halt nature loss by 2030. Jerry Acterman. For your efforts to eliminate polystyrene trays in school. And Peter Seidel. For a lifetime of important work. You're getting the Lifetime Achievement Award. So congratulations to all of y'all tonight. Me again? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I'm just a promoter now, ever since we started this EarthX event, and it's all about this, this big event. Uh, we are the most diverse uh, uh, event addressing all uh, 
issues, not just climate, but farm uh, uh, innovation and technology, especially with the eCapital Summit, which has put hundreds of startups together with capital. Uh, this year and uh, April 22, look for us on April on uh, EarthX TV. Yes, EarthX TV is our new platform. It's a streaming platform on our website and social media. It's balanced, inclusive environmental con conversations, programs, emerging media and films that explore, like Trammell said, business, climate, culture, the environment, youth, women, lots of conferences. So do we do hope you'll tune in. When we started this thing 10 years ago and, and here in Dallas, we had no idea we'd be sitting here today, but somehow in the heart of the country, uh, far from uh, authorities, if you will, we've been able to have a place with free speech, all opinions, uh, different sides together, and all issues, and all timings, and all youth. So from justice to hydrocarbon, uh, and from young to old, we uh, like to pride ourselves on a signature of all perspectives allowed. It is our planet from every side with different views, as Trammell said. So to close, we want to thank Janine and her Leaders in Energy team for putting this event together. We hope you enjoy the show and you must tune into EarthX TV. Janine, we want to be with you. Thank you so much and thank congratulations. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn and Trammell. Thank you. So with that, I'll, I'll bring to the virtual stage our executive director for Leaders in Energy, uh, Janine Benno. Welcome. Well, Let's thank you, Samuel. Phone. It's great to be here. And uh, just uh, really enjoyed the remarks of uh, Lynn and uh, Trammell about all perspectives. Uh, Welcome, because that really just, I think, epitomizes what we're doing here at Leaders in Energy as well, trying to really uh, grow that big tent of um, so many people that, that are needed. And I'll probably touch on that a little bit in my remarks. Um, Samuel, can you go to the next slide, please? Or um, Beth. <laughs> Um, so look, this is our seventh annual 4Gen Awards. Can you believe it? It's like, wow, time flies when you're having a good time. And, um, you know, it's just reminiscing, Samuel, because you and I met at the Beer Baron. Remember when we would hold our events there at the Beer Baron? They had like 400 kinds of beer. I remember, I remember getting in a little trouble on, on some of that beer one time, uh, but had a good time. So I guess you know where the cocktail thing was going this evening, you know, <laughs> you kind of yeah. know where we're at. But um it's kind of fun to just look at all these themes here that we've had over the years, uh, leading through adversity, the urgency of now, um, sparking the passion in others. That's what's been so fun is to have themes and this one is regenerating for a positive future. We just thought that this was really good theme to have with just everything that was going on in our country this year and you know, re hearing about the wildfires and, and so many things, the health pandemic, we thought we really did need to regenerate for a positive future. Uh, next slide, please. So, I don't want to be a downer here. I'm just going to, you know, we, we have a lot of challenges that we really do need to. Uh, I heard uh, someone mentioning um, just uh, a lot of people being unemployed or, you know, being very intelligent and not finding employment. And you can see just these high unemployment numbers here from the shadow government statistics. If you're not familiar with John Williams' site, I highly recommend it because, you know, we read one uh, unemployment statistic in a paper, but it's often much higher, according to him. Uh, and then just all these other things that we're dealing with too, you know, the globalization, increasing automation, of course, the pandemic, uh, the increasing uh, tipping points, you know, just this uh, year uh, article in science about how um, they think we may have reached nine out of uh, 15 tipping points. So, you know, just, just a lot of really important things that we need to be focused on and everything. So um, that's um, when we move to the next slide here. That's why we think we need leaders in energy and we need others, you know, all of our partners here tonight. Uh, just really our vision is a clean, green transformation, big green shift. It just, um, can you go back to that slide, Beth? It just really connects um, a lot of the issues that uh, we are facing. Um, we, so we say for sustainable development, for planetary habitability, for economic stability and growth, a massive shift is needed in a way that we 
think, work, and live. And that's what we refer to as a big green shift. And just briefly highlighting, um, Justine Bird, I don't know how many of you have heard of her. Uh, she's written a fabulous book. It's kind of cool because she talks about how 14.3 million people can be hired in a clean energy sector. And I think right now, uh, President-elect Biden talks about 10 million. So, you know, maybe we can do even a little bit more than that. Uh, and she spoke at our Green Jobs Forum in, in August, um, along with Martin Ogle. I'll just do a, a little shout out because I think Martin's on our call as well, who says, hey, we need to even expand beyond green careers. All careers need to be green. So I really like that um, uh, uh, way that he's going on that. And then um, our honoree uh, tonight, um, Akancha Khatri, um, who will actually be speaking to us by video because she's in Geneva, Switzerland with the time difference. I couldn't uh, do it on Zoom, but she just wrote this really, um, she's the lead author of a groundbreaking report on the future of nature and business, really calling for a radical transformation of how the economy and business can still do very well without destroying our planet and nature. So we're really looking to the bridge um, for our sustainable future. Next slide, please. We can do big things, guys. I mean, look, uh, Apollo uh, launched to the, the moon, you know, the moonshot in the late 60s. And, and then prior to that, we had the Civilian Conservation Corps that employed millions of people during uh, the Great uh, Depression. And I feel we need uh, something along those lines as well. And um, I'm heartened to see the Earthshot Prize. That's a similar big endeavor. Uh, that has been launched to do great things here on, on Earth. So I just wanted to let you know a little bit more about that. Next slide, please. So who are we, who are leaders in energy and what are we trying to do? Um, we're a, a group, uh, you know, professionals in the clean energy sustainability industry um, or others that want to get into the clean energy industry or maybe just um, individuals that want to get more involved um, by making a conscious shift in their lives and communities. And why are we doing this? Um, Malcolm Gladwell in his book, The Tipping Point, talks about a tipping point as that magic moment when an idea, a trend or social behavior crosses a threshold, tips and spreads like wildfire. Tipping point. We at Leaders in Energy are working to accelerate a tipping point for the big green shift. We think that all hands on deck are needed and that everyone in every generation is needed to make this happen. We invite you to join us. Thank you. How was that, Samuel? Fantastic. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, <laughs> and and uh, you know, speaking of the big green shift, this is our first year to do a big green. Oh, and uh, I just see Josh is saying EPA uh, just what was that? Turned fifty. Okay. Um, yeah, because that was, what was it? Nixon started that in 1970. Yeah, thanks, Josh, for um, pointing that out. But this was our first year to do the Big Green Shift sponsor. And um, just I'm so delighted to have EarthX joining us. And um, actually, I have a buddy here from Association of Energy Engineers from Dallas, Texas. So um, I was able to bring him in and let, let him know about our, um, you know, just collaboration with EarthX. So really nice to be expanding our boundaries beyond the Washington, D.C. area as well. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, Bill Ruckelhaus was the first uh, director of EPA. Yes, Anne. And I think he passed away not too long ago as well, which was very sad. Uh, thank you to our sponsors. I don't know, is uh, Keller Staley here or not? I don't know if he, he is or not. I think um, I had a bunch of fun people that would attend these events, but I think because um, we couldn't do it in person, maybe uh, they didn't want to drink virtually. <laughs> So anyhow, thanks to Longenecker and Associates who's been supporting us for seven years from the very beginning. Uh, they're a support services contractor, actually out in Nevada, but they're doing a lot of work for Department of Energy. Uh, and then Catoctin Creek, of course. And then um, you'll hear a little bit more about our environmental leader, Gamblin, a very interesting story on that. Next slide, please. Just a big um, thank you to all of our benefactors. You can see this list. Um, I don't know if Miriam Axel is on the line. Um, I know she was dialing in from Europe, um, but I just really want to thank her. Miriam, are you here? Okay, maybe not. Um, I, I didn't want to put her on the spot, but uh, I just wanted to thank her for everything she's done. And um, hey, you heard it here. She just got her doctorate from Imperial College in, in London. And uh, wow, what a feat that was. So congratulations to, to Miriam. But um, thank you to all of our benefactors here. And um, you can see them on the screen. 
and um, our media partners as well. So, so thank you. We really appreciate everything that you've done to make um, this event and a success and to support our mission and um, our work. Alrighty, thank you, Janine, thank you. So now we are in our awardee section, a brief video for you. video and uh the music was really nice too hopefully you all were dancing a little bit there while it was playing thanks laura from the le team for putting that together um so now we are at the part of the program that you all have been waiting for to introduce uh the awardees and so with that we'll start off with the gen x category of the awardees uh and i'd like to welcome to the virtual stage annette also executive director of resilient virginia Okay, good uh, Good evening, Samuel and company. I'm Annette Oso, and uh, I'm director of Resilient Virginia. I appreciate uh, being part of this event. Uh, Janine Fennell and Leaders in Energy and Art of Resilient Virginia have been longtime partners in doing joint events, so we're really pleased to uh, be able to be part of this. Our organization's goal is to uh, promote a resiliency planning around the state of Virginia. Uh, we work with local governments and community organizations uh, to educate them about the need for climate adaptation. All of this has become more relevant and uh, ha there has been great motivation this year with COVID-19 to know that uh, disasters of various kinds are, happen and climate change being one of them. So um, this was a year in which our organization was going to start with a series of uh, resiliency workshops. We had to, like others, adjust what we're, we were doing and ended up doing four virtual workshops. Uh, what we wanted to do was highlight some of the best national uh, programs uh, and toolkits for resiliency planning from around the country. This is when we found Tanya Graham and the GEOS Institute. Uh, and uh, we were happy that uh, she was one of our presenters at our fall uh, Resiliency Academy workshop series. So um, Tanya Graham leads the GEOS Institute and uh, one of their big programs is the Climate Wise program, which helps communities build resilience in the face of climate change. Uh, in that uh, role, they have developed the concept of whole community resilience, which takes a holistic approach to addressing climate change impact and develops solutions that are ecologically sound, but also socially equitable. Uh, this climate-wise team has worked with communities around the country, uh, Oregon, which is where they're based, California, Montana, Alaska, Texas, Kentucky, Colorado, and in Canada. Uh, last year, so this is a very new uh, toolkit that has been developed, 
She and her team launched the Climate Ready Communities process, which they call an assisted do-it-yourself climate resilience planning program. Uh, this is particularly aimed at uh, providing planning guidance to small, mid-sized, and under-resourced communities nationwide. We were very pleased again to be able to introduce this to Virginia, where particularly in the central and western part of the state, we have many uh, smaller communities who could benefit by such a planning process. Uh, the guide that they put together, which is downloadable for free, is called A Practical Guide to Building Climate Resilience. Again, uh, which gives folks the uh, foundation by which they can work through a process that's very, uh, that connects community uh, organizations as well as local governments and business partners to create uh, a resiliency plan. Uh, Tonya has um, been very involved with the American Society of Adaptation Professionals as a, a relatively new organization that is uh, recognized as uh, having as membership some of the more experienced, most experienced uh, a resiliency planning uh, consulting groups in the country. Uh, she holds a BS in biophysical environmental studies from Northland College and a master's in community development from Goddard College. With that, I would uh, like to introduce Tonya Graham from GEOS Institute as the Gen X awardee. Uh, thank you, Annette. It has been fantastic working with Resilient Virginia these last several months as you've been uh, working with communities across your state. At the GEOS Institute, we help communities build climate resilience. Since 2008, we have worked with communities of different sizes and political persuasions across the U.S. And in the process, we've developed a climbing planet, uh, climate planning framework we call Whole Community Resilience. And in this framework, we help local leaders take a holistic approach to building climate resilience that protects nature, health, culture, and the built environment while moving toward a green economy. I am so honored to receive the 4Gen Award. Climate adaptation and resilience work is all about protecting communities and nature from the impacts of climate change. In other words, preventing bad things from happening as climate changes but it's very hard to measure bad things that don't happen. Our work is also about helping local leaders approach climate resilience holistically, and that's almost impossible to measure. And so receiving an award that spans not only the climate field, but sustainability in general, is an indication of the impact of the work my team and I have been doing for the past 12 years, so thank you. Uh, I particularly appreciate representing Generation X because we often get lost between the boomers and the millennials. We are the latchkey generation or the MTV generation. Uh, according to Wikipedia, we are considered slackers, cynical, and disaffected. But in fact, I see us as taking a powerful role in changing the systems that we are increasingly leading and making a better world in the process. So I am proud to fly the Gen X flag today as I receive this award. So, uh, so much has changed since we started doing this work over a decade ago. I remember our staff processing the climate modeling data for our first project. It took three months and now we can do it in less than a week. But perhaps the greatest change we have seen is the inclusion of social equity as a primary goal of climate resilience. We've seen in our work that those who are already struggling are at a greater risk from climate change than those who are doing well in every single project we have seen this. And we know that many are struggling because of systemic racism. Several years ago, the adaptation field took a deep dive into social equity. And as a result, our whole community resilience framework sits on a foundation of two goals, ecological sustainability and social equity. I've been asked to share why I do the work I do. I was raised by parents who believed strongly in caring for land and people. But as a young adult, I saw that we were doing neither of these things very well and creating serious global problems because of it. I'm fortunate because my work allows me to influence how we care for both the land and people. Our whole community resilience framework creates solutions that work across the community, that engage residents and make use of the best available science and local knowledge. Using this framework, we're able to help local leaders care for people and nature 
as they build climate resilience. It's why we created our Climate Wise program and why I love the work that I do. Climate Ready Communities is the primary focus of my work. And it came about because we realized that most climate resilience work was happening in large urban areas and wealthier small cities, and that other smaller communities, especially those without a lot of resources, were being left behind. We often have a trade show booth at local government conferences. And in 2011, a couple approached my booth, a county commissioner and his wife. They were from Minot, North Dakota, which was in the news at the time because of a massive flood. No one in their community had ever seen anything like it. We talked about climate change and then she asked me how long they would have to deal with this weird weather. I didn't really know what to say to her. And over the years, many local leaders have told us about their challenges and asked what they should do. The only answer we had was to find money and hire someone to help them build a plan. That wasn't a good answer. They knew it and we knew it. So we set out to create our Climate Ready Communities program by writing our step-by-step -step practical guide to building climate resilience, which as Annette said, is available at no cost through our website. And we built a suite of affordable support services for local leaders who need help moving through the planning process. And so now when someone asks us what they should do, we direct them to our free guide and tell them that they can get started building climate resilience today. And that feels so much better. My goal for the future is that our Climate Ready Communities program expands quickly across the US. Every community needs to build climate resilience as part of our larger climate response, and many will not be able to afford a consultant. The leaders in energy hosts have also asked me to offer advice to those who want to make a better, greener world. And so I offer this. There will be days when you want to give up. Keep working. Change that seems to happen overnight is usually decades in the making, but the tipping point is only visible in the rear view mirror. So get clear about what you want, work with like-minded people towards that vision, love the world as you work to protect it. And as William Sloan Coffin suggests, be willing to risk something big for something good. Thank you so much for this Four Gen Award. I'm grateful and honored to receive it. Congratulations, that's fantastic. Can't wait to read the guide and I love the quote, love the world as you work to protect it, fantastic. So I'd like to uh, bring Janine back to introduce us to our millennial awardee. Janine. Thank you, Samuel. And again, thanks also to Annette and, and, and Tonya, just very thoughtful and uh, so nice to have met you, Tonya, through the Resiliency Academy. Um, event that I attended earlier. So um, just love the synergies between our organizations and looking forward to new synergies with the GEOS Institute. Um, so I am introducing our millennial awardee. And um, as I mentioned, each year we develop a special theme for our awards. And um, this year we came across this report that I mentioned earlier called the Future of Nature and Business by the World Economic Forum, which is located in Geneva, Switzerland. And um, I just want to do a little shout out for Van Ajemian, who is joining us from Los Angeles, because that's what I love about the Leaders in Energy Network, is he, he um, just happened to send me this report. And I'm like, wow, this is really amazing. It talks about the need for a fundamental transfer, transformation in a way that our society conducts its activities. You know, as I mentioned before, like 15 systemic transitions. Um, and um, also annual business opportunities worth 10 trillion that could create 395 million jobs by 2030 that they say together can pave the way for a people and nature positive economy, which will be resilient to future shocks. So anyhow, that really got my attention. And as a result of that um, report, um, it really inspired us for this regenerating for a positive future theme. And um, so I'm like, hey, can we, can we nominate a concha? And uh, lo and behold, um, we're able to get a hold of her and um, we are honoring her this year as, as this lead author in developing this report. Uh, Akanji Katri is the head of the Nature Action Agenda at the World Economic Forum based in Geneva, Switzerland. And I chatted with her about her acceptance remarks for the Forge Gen uh, prior to our event. And I'm gonna share that, as I mentioned, with her being in Geneva, it was just uh, you know, gonna be too late for her to stay up and, and join us. Um, 
even if we could entice her with a virtual green cocktail. But uh, anyhow, we'll hear from her virtually. Akansha, welcome. It's just a delight to have you here. We're so honored to have you as our millennial awardee. Could you tell our audience, uh, introduce yourself and just give a brief overview of your work related to the award? Sure, thank you, Janine. Um, yes, my name is Akanksha Khatri. I head the Nature Action Agenda at the World Economic Forum. Um, I have been working on this issue for uh, about three years now. Um, and the work that we I'm leading with my colleagues and my team uh, tries to create a business and economic case for safeguarding nature. Uh, the report that Janine was referring to, um, The Future of Nature and Business, which we released in July of this year, identifies that while fighting climate change is great and necessary, it's not enough. We also need to be able to safeguard our biodiversity as well as the rest of the planetary indicators. Kancha, what does this award mean to you and um, why are you proud to receive it? So on behalf of my institution, my team, uh, I'm really, really humbled to be receiving this reward um, because it's a sign that the work that we have done has been both of good quality, but is also shaping the dialogue and opening eyes towards a much bigger agenda. It is creating a level of awareness amongst citizens, professionals, uh, and leaders to put nature and biodiversity uh, as a mainstream topic in their actions. Um, why are you doing this work and what gives you the fortitude, vision and drive to do this? So I come from uh, India. I've lived all my life in cities. Uh, I come from Delhi. Um, and I have seen over the years of unfettered urbanization and just chasing economic growth has such a big impact on um, the environment and just the natural habitat around us, which means that in turn, it also affects um, the stress level. It also affects um, how people behave with each other and just the overall uh, social fiber um, in, a, in a society gets affected. So for me, when I work on topics like nature, uh, I work on it as um, a pathway towards not just conservation, uh, but a new way of thinking about the economy and growth uh, and almost like challenging our values that just bigger, better is always the right way to go. I would argue perhaps uh, staying sometimes smaller, more local uh, and closer to your people is better uh, for your emotional and physical health. Um, what tips would you give to others who want to make this a better, greener world? Um, so keep up the good fight. Uh, I think we need more and more people uh, who are championing for a different way of living and a different way of operating in the uh, economy. Um, what is also important is that we do not just look at the green only as it's my job or it's my passion, but to be able to bring it together in every aspect of your life. So both in terms of how you choose to vote for your leaders, like are they raising ambition for the planet? How do you choose to uh, buy produce and products? Um, is, it, it, is it done in a way that actually upholds your values? Uh, and most importantly, uh, take care of yourselves because we need resilient individuals uh, if we have to have a systemic change uh, in the coming decades. Thank you so much. Kancha, really, we again are just um, delighted that we learned about the wonderful work that you are doing. Um, love the network. I know that I was able through our network to, to get in touch with you and, and so um, appreciated your response and enthusiasm about what we're doing here at Leaders in Energy. And I hope that this helps to build a bridge in, in the future uh, for continued efforts in terms of what we're doing here in our Global Action Network uh, and in the heart of our activities in Washington, D.C. area and uh, that we can continue to support each other for, as we call the big green shift and you call the great reset. No, absolutely. I'm really humbled um, that leaders in energy with your network, with your experience have chosen to um, 
give me this award, but also highlight uh, the work that we are doing on the topic of biodiversity. So I think um, there's definitely a huge potential to do more things together. Um, and I just hope it inspires at least a few of your network members to continue thinking about this topic. Great. Thank you, Akansha and Janine also for that uh, wonderful introduction. Next up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jennifer Scleru, Department of Environmental Science and Policy at George Mason University. Thank you, Samuel. Hello, everyone. In this gathering, I know that there are many who have dedicated years of their lives to making our world more sustainable. But as a professor teaching on sustainability issues at George Mason University, I can say that it is not often that you meet someone in this category who is under the age of 20. I've known Jerry Acterman for more than 10 years, and he has always impressed me with his vision and his ability to communicate on issues important to him. So I wasn't surprised when he approached me when he was 12 years old with an ambitious revolutionary proposal to make Fairfax County a more sustainable, healthier environment for all students. He had learned about the environmental and health dangers associated with polystyrene trays, and he wanted his school to stop using them. He wanted all schools to stop using them. So we talked about a petition he could circulate at Fairfax County Schools, and Jerry did that, but he went much further. He created two petitions on social media that garnered over 500 signatures from across the state, the country, and the world. We talked about speeches he could make at Fairfax County Schools. And he did that, but he went much further. After an introduction to Miriam Gennari, whom some of you know, Jerry spoke on her sustainable scoop program. He created a PowerPoint presentation on polystyrene trays effects on the environment and health, and he presented it to the Fairfax County School Board. And the decision makers listened. The polystyrene trays were phased out of Fairfax County Public Schools based on Jerry's campaign. Now a freshman at Oberlin College, Jerry can inspire others in Gen Z and beyond. He has shown that young people can contribute to sustainable communities, not just in the future, but now. Jerry, I am proud to know you, and I hope that you continue to motivate everyone around you to help to build sustainability into our communities. Well, thank you so much, Jen. And Thank you to everyone at Leaders in Energy for organizing this incredible event and for spotlighting the extraordinary work of my fellow Four Gen Awardees. It is truly an honor to be with you all tonight. I am Jerry Ochterman. In middle school, I petitioned my school system to replace its polystyrene food service supplies, including trays and containers, with a biodegradable or reusable alternative. Expanded polystyrene is colloquially called styrofoam, a name brand of the material. Um, that's the Kleenex of food service supplies, if you will. So to get the word out about my petition, I spent months approaching everyone at my school and telling them about it. This social trial by fire made it obvious which techniques worked best. Eyes would glaze over if I described how our lunch trays were being burned for energy, releasing talk fumes into the atmosphere. But faces would enliven if I mentioned that joining my cause would be an act of rebellion against the school. I spoke at a school board meeting, followed up with various members of the board and the director of food and nutrition services, and endured over a year of bureaucratic evasion tactics before food and nutrition replaced the polystyrene in the fall of my ninth grade year. The school system never disclosed who incited the change. But the English department at my middle school did construct a civic engagement project around my petition and speeches, using them as an example to inspire other students. In an odd turn of events, my younger sister was assigned this project in eighth grade. And while explaining the assignment, her teacher listed some not quite factual information about me, including that when I made the petition, I was a new student who just moved to Fairfax County from Vermont. This is true, and I have never heard anything more blasphemous. Even so, I am overjoyed that such a small-scale endeavor now has the potential to inspire other young people to start dialogues with community leaders. 
And when I think about what drove me to push for new trays, one word comes to mind, naivete. From an early age, adults have been telling me that the possibilities of life are endless and that I can affect change if I use my voice effectively. Without enough life experience to negate that belief, getting the polystyrene abolished seemed like the obvious course of action. I hope to carry this forward into everything I do. As an outsider who is apparently fresh off the train from Vermont, I can say that there is more work to be done in my community. I want to push for a countywide ban of polystyrene food service supplies, a precedent that has been set by Montgomery County in Maryland. I still dream big, even in semi-adulthood, but it is not radical to say that tension exists both within our psyches and within communities between reform and revolution. We see it in the various changes that well-meaning corporations, governments, and individuals make to take on the climate crisis, ranging from incremental to drastic. We see it in debates over how to best move forward from systemic racism and ongoing police brutality. I see it in the mixed reactions many of my peers have to a future Biden presidency. My perspective is that we can and should do both. Reform and revolution are two equally useful tools in the struggle for a future that works. In my work, I made plans for both. If my appeals to reform through the school board went unanswered, I knew I could get other students, social media, and local media on my side. Success came not from choosing the objectively correct path to institutional change, but by simply trying things. So please, I challenge you, try things. If your middle school self knew everything about the world that you currently know, what would make you angry? Our futures will be shaped by our ability to remember and harness this anger. And what I hope I accomplish more so than alleviating one specific issue in one school system is provided proof that reform and revolution thrive under the collaboration between experienced and inexperienced alike. Tonight has highlighted the advantages that celebrating generational differences afford. Our diverse backgrounds are puzzle pieces for a holistic vision of the future. Thank you so much for this award. It is an extraordinary honor. Wow. Jerry, you make Gen Z proud. You make, uh, you make the gen Generation X and Millennials proud. Great work, great work. And thank you, Dr. Skaru, for the introduction. Uh, next up to introduce the Baby Boomer awardee, I ask uh, William Brandon, VP of Leaders in Energy to join us. Couldn't find the unmute button there. Uh, yeah, I'm Bill Brandon, uh, VP for uh, Leaders in Energy. Uh, Leaders in Energy is helping my cohorts and I stand up a project in Illinois uh, aimed at uh, rural uh, economic regeneration and agricultural CO2 sequestration and other sustainable uh, com uh, components that uh, uh, members of the farm community can use to diversify their incomes. I met uh, Klaus several years ago in a workshop on uh, fuels, transportation fuels and uh, power uh, platforms. Uh, he and I had uh, agreement on one thing about the use of hydrogen was that it was the best use of it was to combine it with uh, CO2. Later, I realized that he was the father of uh, the uh, notion that we should be uh, capturing CO2 from the atmosphere. And uh, he has been doing this for some time. And, uh, and after you capture it, there is the question of what you're going to do with it. And he also initially uh, and still is uh, suggesting that we can mineralize it, that is to take CO2 and put it into uh, rocks to form a, I guess it's a limestone, uh, that's a permanent uh, sequestration of the CO2, uh, but also that you can use it to combine with hydrogen to make uh, 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 fuels. And uh, in making fuels, that is not a sequestration, but it is carbon uh, neutral. 
Uh, so I guess now I am turning this over to uh, Klaus Slackner and giving him virtually his award and let him explain a little bit of how he got into this and, uh, and other remarks that he might like to make. Uh, so Klaus, I guess you're up. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great honor. I, I can't thank you not enough for giving me this award. I also thank you from the bottom of my heart for the opportunity to explain what this is all about and why I got excited about this and how I got interested in it and why it's an important uh, issue to push forward. I got into this nearly 30 years ago. I was working actually on fusion related issues and I realized the world needs an awful lot of energy, uh, but we are creating an awful lot of waste too and our current way of providing the energy for development in developing countries, for rich countries, is simply not sustainable. We have to figure out what to do with it. And I began to see uh, fossil fuel as a form of waste management. We dig up carbon, we extract the energy we need for all sorts of good purposes. And at the end of the day, we then just dump that CO2 in the atmosphere and leave it there. And that is not acceptable. We have to get away from that. The other thing I realized back then, once you put it out there, it's there for millennia. It just doesn't want to go away. And furthermore, that carbon where we are digging, that we are digging up is actually not running out. To my surprise, when I started to look into it, Alaska alone has 10 times more carbon than the world has, has used. We have to figure out how to get away from there. And then ultimately, we need to get past that waste management approach to a scenario where we are talking about zero net waste, where we just stop using carbon. Uh, it's important to work on this, this topic. I realized this in 1992, 1993, and one needs to find solutions. And it actually find, ultimately feels like a, a, a solvable problem. And solar energy has made a big difference in the last few years because it really gives us the option of stepping away from fossil carbon. Meanwhile, we have put so much carbon into the atmosphere that some of it we will have to put away. So looking at the combinations of the two is what got me into, into this and figuring out how to bring those two systems together. An observation I would have right now, the energy transition is already on its way. We can't stop it anymore, and it is actually not driven by climate change. It is driven just like natural gas pushed out coal. Solar energy is starting to push out fossil energy, and we need to figure out how to make this work. Now, my journey started early in the 1990s, and I realized energy is important, and it's done unsustainably, and we have to figure out how to solve this problem. And my first question was, we need to find a garbage dump. If we have all of the CO2, we have to put it somewhere. And I got interested in the idea that we can mineralize all this carbon. Carbon dioxide is an acid. We can bind it with a salt, which is a rock in many cases, and we can turn it into another rock. Limestone, dolomite, magnesium carbonates, those things you can store nearly forever. And I, got, I actually am the one who started this <laughs> as a serious effort in, the, in, in 1995, we wrote a paper on it. We then moved on and today, uh, you can look in Iceland, Kalkfix is doing just that. They are pumping CO2 underground and into the basalt, and a year later, it made limestone. Uh, there's a small company, Carbon Internet, uh, Mineralization International in Australia, which is actually following pretty much the ideas we had, and they are talking about in the future to put vast amounts of carbon away, and in the meantime, sell some of the products. But ultimately, keep in mind, we are producing 40 gigatons of CO2 in the world that is more than we produce uh, sand and, uh, and aggregate uh, gravel, right? So we are so big that we will have to throw some of it away. And ultimately, we can do this by going after the big sources. That was our next project. Where do we, where do we get the CO2 to put away? Well, <laughs> just like you rob banks because that's where the money is, you go to power plants because that's where the CO2 is. But then roughly half of all the CO2 is not there. And so you have to collect the litter from the air. And my big aha moment sometime in 1999 was the sudden realization that there's actually far more CO2 in the atmosphere than there's wind energy. 
and yet we know how to make wind energy uh, wheels work. If I ask how, how much value is in the kinetic energy in a cubic kilometer of air, it's about $300, and that's what a big windmill collects in an afternoon. And we know how to do that. If I gave you a tipping fee for getting rid of the CO2 in a cubic kilometer of, of air, and I pay you $30 a ton for it, there's $21,000 worth of CO2 in that same cubic kilometer of air, 70 times a lot more. That's what got us started. And we got onto a two decade adventure. Uh, we were the first in 2007, you see the picture here of Alan Wright, a colleague of mine who formed a company in Tucson, Arizona, which ultimately stranded on the disaster of 2008. But he had a plan and he actually demonstrated that he can with this device he's standing next to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. This was our design. Then we went out and we tried to raise money. Unfortunately, <laughs> the week, um, uh, the bottom fell out on a device which could have done this. Then we regrouped uh, we were at Columbia University and we worked and researched the problem. Then I came to Arizona State University because they offered the opportunity to get into negative emissions, to clean up again, to have the drawdown by pulling CO2 back out of the atmosphere. And we built this prototype you see here in 2016. We are planning on a new prototype. You see the picture here of where we were in 2019 and right before COVID came along. And if you go to the next slide, you can, you can see now that we are working with a startup company at Silicon Kingdom Holdings, uh, you can see their plan for building tree farms, mechanical tree farms of lots and lots of these in Arizona State is in the middle of this. And we will be the place of the first, first prototype. And it's our ideas and our concepts which go into this. Think of these disks, these flat round disks as the leaves on a tree and the tree, each one of those is about 10 meters tall and they collect CO2 for half an hour to an hour, then they drop into these buckets at the bottom, these drums at the bottom where we then ex remove the CO2, extract the CO2, process it on and we can do with it whatever we want to do. And the opportunities here are nearly limitless. You can sell CO2. Currently, you get paid $100 a ton for most CO2 you deliver on the back of a truck. But that's too tiny to solve the problem. We need to solve the overshoot problem. The world has put out CO2, and I predict that this century, we will come around to the view that we will have to take 100 ppm back. That means we have to collect 40 gigatons of CO2 for 40 years. 40 gigatons a year is what the world emits today. 40 gigatons a year is what it would emit in 2100 if the last 20% of the emissions cannot be controlled because we grow fivefold between now and then at a 2% growth. But the really exciting part to me is we can close the carbon cycle. With the revolution of solar energy coming into the system, we will have too much electricity in the system to actually use it as electricity. A lot of it will be used to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. And as you just heard from Bill, hydrogen is great, but it's much more easily moved around and used and transported if you stick it to a CO2 and now you make methanol. And if you can make methanol, you can make gasoline, you can make diesel, you can make jet fuel. You can actually run the entire economy on a horribly intermittent solar energy, which is only there during daytime hours. You can transport that energy to places where it's cold and where the sun doesn't shine. And you can literally run the world on solar energy and you could run the US on solar energy produced in the Southwest. We have plenty of room to do that and we can build this out and direct air capture is sort of the help in the middle because what it does is it collects the CO2 back. Once that airplane landed somewhere, there is no way to collect, collect the CO2 but get it out of the atmosphere again. We are planning to be able to do this and build an energy economy which is plentiful and at the same time is sustainable and clean because there's so much solar energy available that we can't run out of it. And that's basically the picture we have now been pushing forward for oh, nearly three decades. And it's, it's making progress and people are gradually listening in part because climate change is starting to hurt. Back in 1990, it was the theoretician's view of, well, there is a problem. In 2000, you could, with good scientific instruments, see it. In the tens, teens, you could tell that it's there, even if you just look at it and you are not in 
in the science business, I think this, this decade, it will really hurt. And therefore, we will start doing something. And so I'm looking forward to finding ways of getting the drawdown, getting, which will require sequestration and storage, and closing the carbon cycle in a way that we don't need fossil fuels anymore. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Klaus, and congratulations again, and William, for the introduction. We'll now go to our uh, video clip for the next segment. Yes, to introduce um, our Lifetime Achievement Awardee, I'd like to welcome Dr. Brian Check. He's the Executive Director of the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy. Welcome, Dr. Check. Thank you, Samuel. And, uh, you know, it's really an honor to be able to serve as the person who uh, helps leaders in energy deliver the award virtually to Peter Seidel. Uh, I'm not actually going to introduce him so much because this little video clip will do that and then I'll come back for a few minutes. But uh, I think if Peter were here, he would definitely wanna start by thanking leaders in energy for all they do. These awards are very helpful. Uh, they encourage people a lot. And uh, I think Peter would also want to congratulate his fellow award winners, all the way from Jerry up through Klaus. And uh, Peter is, is a fellow who I think would also tell you the story that in the 1950s, he ran across a book called The Challenge of, uh, Human, of Human's Future. And uh, it was by Harrison Brown and it changed his life. He had kind of an epiphany that he needed to be dealing with uh, bigger, longer term issues than he had prior to that. And so I think that is what set him on the path to those kinds of issues and ultimately to this Lifetime Achievement Award. So now we're going to see a little video clip that's actually uh, a fellow in Cincinnati, David Serber, who runs a syndicated uh, PBS show uh, I think it's called Nature's, uh, uh, well, you'll see, I think, because the clip is going to include that little intro to the show, and then David Serber is going to introduce Peter Seidel. And finally, before we get to the clip, I think you'll also notice that, uh, especially in, in this little excerpt from the broader interview that Serber had of, of Peter, uh, there aren't a lot of solutions talked about. That's partly a function of the interview itself, the questions that, that Peter was hit with, but also uh, the fact that at that, in his younger time, he was 89 at the time, <laughs> he hadn't thought a whole lot just yet about solutions. So when we come back from the clip, I'd like to tell you what he's been up to since that 89th year of his in 2015. Now, if we could have the clip, please. Peter Seidel is a true Renaissance man. A native of Milwaukee, he has worked as a farmhand, factory worker, Alaska salmon fisherman, carpenter, naval electronics technician, and is a graduate architect with a master's degree. Along the way, he has taught college in China and India. I know the direction which we're going, which is terrible. and. What will happen, I do know that it, it's not going to be the kind of planet that we're used to today or in the past. You mean for our children? It's, it's, it's not, no. But we hope that it'll be a, a planet that'll be livable. That there will still be much left and much worth saving. But there is the possibility that the whole life system on the planet could be destroyed. That's not a nice thought, is it? It's not a nice thought, but it's, uh, and it's up to us. 
right. what we just you know what we well, what we do. The reason that we can go on um, living like we are is because we are dis destroying the planet at this point. This is this is how we manage to do it by so by we're, we're consuming it. Yeah, we're consuming it. We're over. We're we're. we're taking too much out of the ground, we're putting in too much pesticides, too much fertilizer, we're overfishing, the amount of fish in the oceans is way, way down. I think there is time if we react and start doing things and changing our habits the way we do things now, and became aware of what we're doing and decided, you know, enough, um, we're going to change. I think that, that, pro that we probably could keep on living on the planet, I think that's yes, most but likely. What we're hearing when we when we listen to the, the news on, and, you, and people, especially the business news, they talk about we've got to have more growth in order to give people jobs. You know, and how in the world can we have more growth when we've already exceeded the, the planet's ability to support? I edited a book before this one and had a number of people write in it, and one of them was, was uh, David Pimentel and his wife. He was, he's in the agriculture school at Cornell. He has calculated how many people sustainably the planet could support living in a, in a, in a decent way with enough. Do you enough remember that calculation? Do you yes. What is it? What Two billion. It? Well, that plant, we're way over that. We're way over it. It's up to us to go out and understand what we are, you know, what's happening in the world, what we are doing to it. We've got to know that, and we've also got to know about our own brains, about how they work. Because why don't we respond to this information? This information is out there if people would be, would look for it. Is it the fault of the media? And be, and be moved to it. It is, part, it is partly, yes, because the, one thing you hear on the media is these constant programs about we've got to have more growth for, for, in order for people to have jobs. Thank you, Samuel. And uh, yeah, and I mentioned the book that, that got Peter on this track before it was actually the challenge of man's future. And he, he told me this story a number of times of how that changed his life. And I think he had, he hoped for something like that. He hoped to have that effect with this book, Uncommon Sense, which just came out uh, about a month ago. And, uh, and Peter's birthday, uh, two days ago, put him at the age of 94. So that alone to me is quite an accomplishment uh, to be still at this uh, so, okay, Uncommon Sense. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about this book because in this he does try to get at some of the, uh, the, the ideas toward solutions for uh, overcoming the shortcomings of the human mind for handling big picture long-term challenges. The book is a very uh, concise, simply structured book. He's got observations from his lifetime in chapter one and kind of an overview of the problems of the world caused especially by population growth and economic growth. In chapter three, there's an analysis of the human brain, especially, and how it evolved and why it's uh, not the best tool for dealing with, with the problems of chapter two. And then chapter four extrapolates that uh, those shortcomings of the brain into society and so on. And in chapter five, then you can see it's kind of a play on words, changing our minds because it's overcoming the shortcomings of the human mind. Next slide, please. And the first thing he does is he, he, uh, he registers one last complaint, which is that not all the responses that we're trying, we've been trying for so long, are bound for success. And I'm gonna summarize these uh, with these bulleted points, a techno fix approach, microeconomic myopia, and quote unquote, green growth. Uh, by the way, he didn't have, he doesn't have a problem. He never had a problem with technological fixes for certain problems, but that notion that we can constantly uh, overcome ultimate even limits to growth with only, or with technological progress, which itself requires a tremendous amount of resource uh, he felt was always misleading 
And so as a uh, approach, he felt it's uh, insufficient. You got to put the horse before the cart instead of what we see here. Uh, next slide, please. And so then he has a few sections in that chapter five about the things that we really ought to know more about and study. And he literally is pushing this idea for academia of what he calls very plainly, but very clearly big picture and long-term studies. And with this sort of uh, uh, almost this uh, oxymoronic sort of notion of studying the future, but uh, you know, we have in climate science and, and biodiversity uh, studies and so on, efforts to get at what's the world gonna be looking like. And then, so he, he has also proposed this, uh, this concept of what he's calling a fiction literature. It's not fiction, nor is it nonfiction, but it's a taking of scientific facts and, and extrapolating trends and then developing stories around the scenarios of, of those trends. And in fact, uh, well, I was gonna show you a different slide, but you have them, but uh, he's got a book coming out, one more, believe it or not, called 2145, where he himself has taken a crack at this A fiction literature. Uh, I would think that would be coming out sometime middle of next year or so. Next slide. He really uh, got onto a, a topic that he hadn't dealt with in the past. He, he uh, after that chapter three about the shortcomings of the human brain, he did happen to notice, as I think a lot of us have, that a lot of these problems we face, especially with, uh, you know, violence and uh, uh, raw bone capitalism and, and so on. Well, I think we have to face facts that over history, these have been uh, propitiated primarily by the male of the species. And so, you know, he's thinking like, uh, as in common with a lot of feminist philosophy and so on, that maybe it's really time to think seriously about bigger role for women in various, in well, in general, uh, because of the life-giving, caretaking, nurturing role that has generally gone with the female uh, uh, package. And so, you know, the, the uh, concept of Mother Earth didn't just come from nowhere. Maybe that's what we really need is to uh, embrace that. Uh, next slide. Peter's always been a very practical fellow as well. And so, you know, he's, he has encouraged us. And I'm, I would think once again, from Jerry all the way through Klaus, uh, we have people here, leaders in energy has had generations of people over the years that uh, must be thinking about this. You know, can you see yourself uh, in that, the, the slide there? You know, we probably should have had a female version of that following up from the last slide. I think this is the only one we could find that that's available. Uh, but like he points out, you know, what's life about? It's not really for accumulating political capital. And, and in fact, politics isn't really about winning elections either, at least not with the issues that that he's getting at in the book. And so he, what he suggests is getting political in order to advance the steady state economy as the alternative, the sustainable alternative to economic growth, to unsustainable growth. Uh, next slide. And then he, he does, he's a, does a pretty gutsy thing, I would say, because not everybody's gonna be happy with this part of the book, but he points out the fact that uh, a lot of the big environmental NGOs, especially, they have uh, they've left the heavy lifting of dealing with population growth and GDP growth to others, and they've really they've really just uh, thrown up their hands at that. I'll name some names. He would, I'm sure, Sierra Club and. Natural Resources Defense Council, the Nature Conservancy, uh, World Wildlife Fund at times. And yeah, it's, uh, it's been a real phenomenon. And so when you're thinking about who to support like leaders in energy, for example, 
uh, it's these big picture long term issues that Peter in this part of the book encourages people to think seriously about and look seriously at the organizations in lieu of. Uh, next slide. So, yeah, I think that uh, the things that characterize Peter that brought him to, to get this prestigious award is uh, an unquenchable curiosity, a relentless focus that he did develop after, after uh, the 1950s, a big picture, long-term focus, but he's always been a very kind and humble fellow as well. And uh, he himself has provided tremendous amount of support for the right causes that he's helped to identify here. And, uh, and I think it's safe to say that he may have saved the best for the last with the book on common sense. And then I, I put the question mark there because 2145 may still be coming out as well next year, but uh, this is a good one. And uh, I know he would, he's very happy to have uh, gotten this award. He's aware of it. And I wanna thank everybody at Leaders in Energy for, for making this happen too. Thank you, Dr. Check. Much appreciated. And uh, let's give another virtual round of applause for Peter Seidel to be awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, next up, we'll have uh, our resident artist, Dr. Elvin Yuzugulu, uh, to present the story behind our four gen award plaques. Hi, everyone. Can you can you hear me? Sorry, I always have computer issues. It seems like yes, we can hear you, Alvin. Good. Oh, is my oh, Alvin? Your screen is blurred. Yeah, I don't know why it says cancel spotlight video. I have no idea where that came from. <laughs> I just clicked the video, but yes, we've spotlighted you, Alvin. So you you stand as okay. the speaker. So yeah, go ahead. What's up? Yeah, Beth, I don't know. Should you maybe not spotlight her or um because I'm I'm just seeing it blurred. Yeah, I am too, but I didn't do anything. I just turned the video on. Yeah, so it, it doesn't have anything to do with a spotlight feature. Okay, thank you, Beth. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, it gave me the option to cancel. Maybe that will get it back to normal. <laughs> uh, I don't mean to delay. That's okay. Let's try that. Um Anyway, even if you hear me or don't, I mean, even if you don't see me, hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, and, and someone just pointed out they're fine because they can see the slides, so yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, um, this um, oil paint company, Gamblin, I kind of stumbled across them because I've been getting into art and I follow a couple of different, you know, um, art companies. And they talked about these colored col colors called reclaimed earth colors. I'm like, huh, this is interesting. And it, it's a very unique story. They take um, polluted river water, you know, water polluted because of acid mine drainage from coal operations. You know, you can imagine the water all brownish and reddish. Well, what gives it those colors are the toxic metals and it is damaging to the environment, but they can turn those back into pigments that they use in their paints. I mean, it becomes non-toxic and it's back to paints. Meanwhile, you know, treating the water. And this started as a little experiment, but then, you know, between an artist and an engineer, and environmental um, person um, cooperating with Gamblin, they've scaled this up. So they're now really treating the water plus creating these colors. And that's not the only circular or environmental thing they're doing. Um, in their factories, when they process these pigments, um, they usually have pigment dust, so they have air filtration systems. Um, well, at the end of the year, instead of throwing all the stuff accumulated in the filtration systems, they turn that back into pigment too for the paint and call it torrid gray. Um, even in their packaging, they use actual um, canvases, wood canvases from another company. Um, that's, these guys are in Portland, Oregon, by the way. Um, so minimizing any plastic or excess, I mean, instead of throwing out the package, you have a canvas to paint on. So it's all these, like every step of the way, they think about what they can do. So they're not um, 
throwing anything away and, you know, turning everything back into paint pretty much. Um, Jenny, should I go on on to the kind of the plaque themes or? Sure, yes. Um, uh, Beth, could you advance? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so, I mean, I was honored, <laughs> went on to this, had this crazy thought of, you know, well, what if we hand painted the plaques this year, if we can get gambling? I mean, we admired Gamblin so much that we reached out to them and they donated a you know wonderful set of paints and related materials. So it was like, well, maybe I can, <laughs> you know, hand paint the plaques, make it more personal. Um, so we'll shortly be sharing those, I mean, the pictures of them, but they will be um, mailed out to all our um, awardees um, once the paint dries. <laughs> but um, we were thinking, you know, you'll see in the plaques, the four generations actually kind of very nicely fit with the four elements that we all know of, you know, air, earth, water, and fire. Um, and like, if you think about um, the baby boomers, they're kind of like earth, they're grounded, they're stable, you know, um, and then me being a proud Gen Xer, I guess, um, I'm claiming we're like water because we're experiencing both the 20th and 21st century kind of flexible and fluid. Um, air, millennials bring, brought with them a lot of, you know, um, big changes and everything, kind of the winds of change. And then we actually saw that with our um, awardee's um, speech with Jerry, how on fire he was, you know, they're bringing, they're speaking out, they're on fire. So this is very nice the way, you know, the elements and the generations fit. So I try to do my best to, you know, paint little landscapes or, you know, images depicting these elements in the awards and hopefully the awardees get to enjoy them. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Beth, can you now uh, proceed uh, to the next slide? And uh, it just gives me great honor to, uh, gosh, Alvin, thank you so much. I just uh, thought it was brilliant in terms of your idea. Uh, and I know you and I have been thinking for some time about, huh, how are we going to do these award yeah. plans? Uh, you were uh, not familiar. Um, painting in oil is, is a new medium for you. Uh, you can do and now I'm in love with it. So yeah, so <laughs> I'm so brave, and it. you just jumped in there, and um, and uh, so anyhow, I'm so excited uh, just on a number of um, reasons here to be giving these wonderful awards to our awardees and uh, just everything that these uh, awards embody in terms of the sustainably produced paint. So uh, let's advance the slide, and um, we will now. This is the um, baby boomer. Uh, awardee uh, plaque that Alvin has painted with the um, earth theme and uh, it's been given to uh, Klaus Lochner uh, for um, in honor of his uh, work for regenerating for a positive future. So I guess round of applause for um, Dr. Lochner. <laughs> okay, uh, next you. slide please. Okay, now this is um, uh, the uh, water slide of uh, the water element uh, for the Gen Xer uh, awardee, uh, Tonya Graham, and um, quite quite lovely with, with all the water there, the element that you were, were talking about. So round of applause for uh, Tonya Graham for our uh, Gen X uh, awardee and, and everything that uh, she's been doing. Oh, I guess I should say advance the slide. Okay, oh, no. and um, here's the wind, you know, with the uh, kite uh, attached to the, the bench here. And this is for Akanja Katri, our millennial awardee. And uh, let's have a round of applause for, for Akanja. And hopefully she'll be watching our video uh, in a recording uh, when she is able to do so. And uh, the next slide. Oh, and you're getting a comment. Lovely uh, work, so very zen. Uh, so uh, interesting to get some uh, reactions from the audience as well. And here's the fire that you were talking about um, that yeah, we kind of heard that, um, you know, the passion and just that zest uh, for doing things. Getting another comment. Very nice, Elvin. Uh, so this is for uh, Jerry Ackerman, our um, Gen Z. Um, Awardee. So round of applause, everyone, for um, Jerry and um, his contributions here. And then um, lastly, um, with um, P. 
Peter Seidel, um, Elvin combined all the elements because she thought lifetime achievement, uh, he's gone through all of these generations and isn't that really neat in the middle with the um, theme of regeneration uh, with the plant growing out uh, and, and the earth uh, on top of it. So um, just uh, uh, I mean, let's have a round of applause for Peter Seidel, the uh, lifetime achievement awardee. And um, again, thank you, Elvin, for just the beautiful, beautiful work and, that you did. And um, just thank really you for making the lovely so comments. So individual. And uh, did you want to say one thing more? <laughs> no, I was just saying thank you, everyone, for the nice comments. <laughs> yeah, just just wonderful. And um, now, Elvin, how long does this paint have to dry? I, well, oil does take longer. Um, like I worked with acrylics before, so I'm not sure. Okay, well, we'll I let it dry we, before we yeah, mail but, them out to the yeah. award. I know, so I don't want to damage it. We're just giving everyone a heads up that I, we'll, we'll be sending these out. Yeah. So, I do um, have the originals here, but if my camera is still blurry, it seems like I'm, you know, I was going to try to show them on camera. But <laughs> Do you have tape on the, there might, we were thinking that that might be the issue. There you go. It looks a little clearer. Oh man, was my camera just dirty? <laughs> now I feel <laughs> really stupid. But <laughs> well, thank you very much, Alvin. Yeah, yeah. And again, you're getting a lot of uh, wonderful exclamations. Yeah, Jim Shulman saying bravo, Alvin, example. for expressing your created your creativity on uh, earth serving, uh, earth saving world. Uh, Tonya Graham saying they're so beautiful inside and out. So just just really oh, kudos you. Yeah. to you, Alvin, for your creativity and just a brilliant idea on combining the generations with the um, earth elements. Yeah, ho you. hopefully, you know, awardees get to enjoy and have a little bit of brightness <laughs> in their day. <laughs> Samuel, back to you, I guess. Thank Thanks, you. Janine. Thanks, Alvin. And uh, Alvin, uh, we've had a few comments to ask, where do they see more of your work? So <laughs> feel free to post your your uh well your... i'm not that official yet i do intend okay. to play kind of like an artist instagram and facebook i sometimes post a few things on my personal facebook page okay but, but i'll let leaders and energy know once i'm more formalized stay tuned everybody stay yeah. tuned the artist that i missed will let you know when she's out <laughs> So just because we're virtual, uh, you probably didn't think that we'd have door prizes because where's the door on the computer? But we do because uh, that's we're, we, we wanna make sure that everyone that came uh, feels appreciated. So with that, I will introduce Marty uh, Silver back to the virtual stage to help us go through the door prizes. We'll watch a brief <laughs> Hey everybody, uh, welcome back. Uh, now we're gonna get into our door prizes. Um, I must say, I'm very excited. We actually have a lot of door prizes to go through. So, um, and we might be a little bit sort of uh, wacky in how we give them out um, because we ended up starting out about three door prizes and now we have about 20. So, um, so please bear with us. Um, as we get through them. Um, I would ask you to, um, when we call out your name that you won a door prize, uh, please put your name in the chat box as well as, you know, saying hello, yelling out, doing something um, to, to let us know that you're here. We're gonna uh, be giving out the door prizes only to folks that are still here. Um, the second thing is we're going to um, get in touch with you via email to let to find out the best way to get you your uh, your prize. Some of them are actually, you know, um, digital. You know, we can give it to you via email. Some of them we're going to actually mail to you. So just depending on the prize. Um, these are all amazing gift uh, door prizes. Uh, some of them have actually been donated by by our wonderful sponsors. So we really appreciate all our sponsors for donating um, the door prizes to us. Again, so um, we're gonna get started with our first door prize. Uh, we have two copies of our door prize. Uh, the first one 
is for this book called Finding Zero um, and is written by Amir Az Azel. Sorry if I mispronounce that. Um, and uh, this, this first uh, book goes to Tanya Graham. Um, so is Tanya Graham still here? She is. Hey, hey Marty, uh, can, I, can I just jump in? This is Janine and to yeah. Tonya as well. Um, I've read this book. This is like a Dan Brown, uh, Indiana Jones true story. And it's the father of our director of communications, Miriam Axel, who wrote the book. I think you'll really enjoy it. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I must say, I'll be honest. I haven't, uh, I have actually sampled all the liquor and the coffee, but I haven't read the books. So I can, I'm a good, um, I, I know what those uh, door prizes are like. Hey, Marty, um, there's a question in the chat box. Um, they want to know how you drew the prizes and if you're drawing them all for yourself or what's going to happen. Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> actually, um, I am a CPA, so I could actually go through all that. Um, I uh, tell you how, you know, that I, I use Price Waterhouse and, and all that to come up with how, who won the prizes, but I actually used a random number, you know, calculator on Excel to come up with those numbers and match them to your name. And so it is all very random. Um, and so that's how we did it. Um, and I did this earlier today, so I don't have to um, embarrass myself any more than I am uh, coming up with everybody's um, as we go through this process. Does that ever answer your question? Uh, Beth, does that answer your question? Yes, I just thought it was good that, that people knew that. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, the next person that won the prize is Patrick Re uh, Rialza. Is Patrick here? I can't tell. No? Let's see. Is Patrick here? No, I don't think so. Okay, what about um, Dan Moss? Nope. Uh, how about Judy Kos Kosovich? She's here. Ah, uh, excellent. If we can have Judy uh, open up her line if you, and video. All right. Yeah, she's uh, here. All right, we're set on the door prize number one. Uh, door prize number two. Next book, we've actually heard a little bit about Uncommon Sense. Um, we have two copies. We are so fortunate. Um, again, written by Peter Sattel. And um, so let's see, are these two copies um, I'm, Tamike Styles? Looks like Tamike is not online at the moment. How about uh, Albert Nunez? Albert Nunez. We have, we don't have a Nunez. Let me check. I feel like you're taking attendance in class. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Um, how about uh, Brett Skibo or Ellie? Should we hmm. say okay? Should we say absent if we're using the school analogy? No. Okay. Let's. Uh, I'll I'll go through one more. Um, uh, oh, Livona and Brian Check is saying, uh, for your information, people that join Cassie get a free copy. So um, anyhow, 
Sorry, Marty, didn't mean to interrupt you. Sure, one more. Lavona Grow. Yes, I'm here. Oh, Woo excellent. <laughs> All right. Way to go, Lavona. You'll love that book. I've read it. It's really good. Great. I'm excited. Excellent. We can talk about it when we get it. together. <laughs> yes, our little happy hour. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, let's um, go to door prize number three. Um, this is the book, uh, The Climate Action Challenge. Um, it's a proven uh, plan um, for launching your eco initiative in 90 days. Uh, it also comes with a workbook as well. Um, uh, let's see, Janet Murphy. Is Janet here? She is. Yes, I am. Here I am. Great. I would love to have that. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <clears throat> okay, number four, prize number four. Let's see, two tickets. So these are two individual tickets to potential energy DC event. Um, actually, Potential Energy DC is one of our strategic partners. Um, it's a great way to uh, network with startup companies. Uh, actually, I went to one of their pitch events uh, yesterday, um, and which was basically startup companies giving um, a pitch, uh, raising money for their particular um, company that they have founded. Um, so um, those are those are actually monthly, and as well as there's other events they have that help teach you how to, you know, structure raising capital or how to um, certain you know elements of growing your business, your startup business. So this is certainly a great organization to get involved in, um, and so we're we're fortunate that there's. Uh, a uh, partner of ours. Um, and, and Marty, we'll be partnering with them next month with the right. uh, seventh annual Green Finance Forum. So they got to so be good. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a great event. Um, and we'll be hearing more about that. Um, again, that's going to be the end of January. Um, the two people um, that won tickets is number one is uh, James Holder. James, are you here? You know, Marty, he was driving across. Oh, um, sorry, I'm here. Oh, he yep. is here. Oh, James, yeah, no, here. I was an issue with my AirPods. <laughs> we All right. Up. We're keeping you awake, James, on your big trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, James and then uh, again um, is Albert LaFrance here. Yes, it looks like. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, excellent. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. So door number five, I'm sorry, door prize number five. Uh, again, this prize I actually had um, for myself. Um, I use this get uh, walking back from a, a long night at a couple of bars. So um, this is a great, great, um, Great thing to have. Um, Marty, are you serious? What? No, not at Yeah, night. it's great. Okay. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, it's great. Um, see, so let's see. Um, Steph, is it Stephanie or Steph Wilson? Is she here? Yes, she's listed as an attendee on the she says she's here in the chat, yeah. Oh, excellent. All right, congratulations. Okay, door number six. Oh yeah, this is another another one that I have tried. And I I, I have this stuff almost every night, but every night I barely, barely alive the next day. Um, this is great hot sauce. Um, it is actually 
Um, this hot sauce is actually aged in the whiskey barrels at the distillery. Um, so I bought this when we were out there on November 5th and I actually have it right here. If you want to see it on screen, it's, it's great stuff. Um, it's, it's probably, you know, just as good as drinking whiskey. So um, let's see for door number six, I'm sorry, prize number six, um, Gabby Seltzer. Gabby should be here. Yeah, she's okay. here, Marty. She says she's very excited about the prize. All right, excellent. All right, door number door prize number seven. Oh, this is my favorite one. This is the perfect sample pack. Again, I have this also. So um, uh, it's gin and whiskey, and it actually comes with a glass as well. Um, so very exciting. Um, and uh, let's see. Actually, this goes to um, Stephen Offit. Yay, I'll take that. Uh, excellent. Wow, Steve, that's fantastic. That's great. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's my favorite too. <laughs> we'll have to have drinks together. So. <laughs> All right, door, uh, door prize number eight. Oh, I have this one also, can't believe it. Uh, an aroma of whiskey and coffee in one. It is definitely great stuff. I have it right here holding it up. Um, it truly is. When you open up the coffee beans, you smell the whiskey. It is, it's just incredible. You actually don't want to drink the coffee. You just want to keep smelling the whiskey. Um, what it is is actually the coffee is um, aged in the whiskey barrels. Um, so that's how they get the smell of the whiskey because it's it's aged in the uh, in the um, in the barrels. It's just amazing. Um, so um, for uh, door prize number eight, um, actually it's uh, Tamika Styles again. Hey, that, is that random generator working right? Yeah. But how could you call her twice? Uh, well, we, I guess I didn't take her out of the first time. Um, Janine. Well, uh, we can, let's go to door prize number nine. Ooh. Leo Perez wants to know, can his name be put in? Not, I mean, just not to get that prize, but just to be put in the drawing. Was it put, put in initially, Jean? I think he registered a little late. Yes, it can. Um, door prize number nine. This um, this book um, I've has. I've got a copy of it right here. It's a yeah, beautiful book. <laughs> Go ahead, Marty. But I I actually got a copy. Oh, that's great. So um, this book for 50 years, um, this 50 is years Earth of Earth Day. Right. Do you want to plug in anything else? Yes, um, I'll plug in. Um, you'll be getting to this next one, the beautiful calendar as well. Well, I, yeah, it, it really is gorgeous. Very nicely done for, uh, from EarthX. Oh, and uh, Lara registered late too, and she wants to see, can she be also be put in a door prize drawings? Hey, you know, thanks for everyone bearing with us. We're wondering how to do door prizes virtually. And maybe in the future, what we'll do is um, just base it on the people that are actually in the Zoom meeting. Because um, we knew at a three hour event, we're gonna have a lot of people coming and going. 
Great. So, um, oh, Toby Warden says she registered late too. You got a whole slew of people that want prizes. <laughs> so, uh, can Toby put be put in there too? Well, what we'll do is we'll take the extra prizes that we have and we'll create and we'll then we'll um, we'll we'll put everybody into that for that group of prizes that we have that are extra. Um, so the next prize is the EarthX um, uh, for this um, for their book that they um, gave to us, and um, for that we actually have five um, five books. So the um, the first person that gets it is um, uh, let's see, um, Kari Klaus. Is Kari here? Doesn't I don't look see like her name. Yeah. What? I don't see her name. Okay. What about Matt Chester? I don't see him. Uh, Natalie Osborne. Uh, she had to leave early. I mean, she had to leave after the awards program. So I think, yeah, some a bunch of people left after the awards program. Uh, John Gaffigan. Mm -hmm. Chicken dinner. <laughs> Excellent. You're the man, Marty. I don't care what anybody says. I don't think the singer's hacked at all. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Oh, there's a question from Mar Carol McCaffrey, but I don't know if um, she wants to know, did you put the Eventbrite people also in the hat? I did. Yes, I did. Okay. I think Francois was emailing all of that. Uh, and uh, Laura Lau? She appears to be on. Okay. She barrels. We know where to find oh. Laura. No, she's there. She's here. there. All right. Laura's here. Okay. Laura is here. So we have three uh, people that were not here. So Van Ajamian. Um, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, excellent. Yes. Oh, Van, you're here. Oh, very good. Great. Nice to have you from uh, California. Yeah, it's, it's cold. <laughs> oh, really? How cold is it? Well, we're, we're thin skinned here, thin blooded. Um, I think it got under 60. So that's cold. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> you are thin, <laughs> thin blooded. Okay. Hey, Vin, how, how are you going to survive under 60? Good Lord. <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> Just cowboy up. You'll get it. Cowboy up. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Did, um, I, what about Sheedy Chesser? No. Um, Linda Staheli? Now she had to leave, I think. No, she's not on. All right. Well, I think we're learning maybe a new way to do door prices next time. Yes, I think we're going to, we'll yeah. let that ask you the, the next box. Okay, let's go to door prices. Um, Marty, we're, we're good. everybody's going to get a door prize with all the defections. At the end of the day, everybody will get one. That's right. Um, so uh, the calendars, um, Demian Pedroza. Hey, I got another idea, Marty. Maybe we just put everyone at once one, 
Maybe they just put their name in a chat window. Put their name in chat window. Would that work? D Damien's here. Damien's, Damien's here. Uh, Jennifer Scleru. Uh, she's showing here. Yes. Oh, she's here. Uh, Lee Williams. Yes. No. Lee Williams is not here. No. Okay. Um, Gian, uh, Gian Poor Hero. Let's see. She's not here either. Uh, Wendy Howard. Not showing up. No. Um, Sabrina Lit Lintz. Nope. No. Wait, hi. What? <laughs> Sabrina's here. Oh, hello. I want a thing. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, how about, um, let's see. Uh, Beth Oppenbach. Beth is here. Woohoo for Beth. I'm here. All right. oh, thank you. What a lovely gift. Thank you. They're beautiful, okay. Beth. I can drop one off at your house. Well, let's see. No, I can't because I got to keep the one they sent me. <laughs> but we'll get you one. Thank you. And uh, I think we have one more. Uh, Eve Hamilton. No. Um, how about Joanne, if if uh, Eve Nick, Eve Keek, Ivanic, Ivancic, I'm yeah. here. Hi, <laughs> Joanne. Good to have you Sorry. on the line. <laughs> That's all right. Where when I wherever I worked, people would call and they'd say exactly that, and everybody knew who they were calling for. Oh, Hi, that's apologies. great. That's wonderful, Joanne. Nice Terrible. to have you here from Frederick. <laughs> thanks. It looks like a beautiful gift. And thanks for your support, uh, being a media partner with your Advanced Biofuels USA. Really appreciate it. Happy to do it. And uh, door prize number 10. I'm sorry, 11. Oh, this is a good one. Oh, uh, yeah, this is a great one. Um. Actually, the we the person that it goes to is John Shope. Is that this? Is he still on the line? No. How about Klaus Slackner? Boy, he's raking it in if he's still here. No, oh, he's still here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, here. I'm too far away. You're going to ruin this stuff before it gets here. So. Well, you're going to really like us. <laughs> this is Bill Brandon. I'll accept for him. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. I'll donate. <laughs> He places it in Centerville because it's called Seaville, by the way. Charlottesville. Ah, Charlottesville. Okay. Donated from Annette Oso with Resilient Virginia. 
Thank you, Annette. You're a sweetheart. <laughs> good, very good stuff. I can attest to that. So. <laughs> it looks very dangerous. <laughs> Ooh. Dangerously good. So um, if you can bear with me, Janine and I are going to um, basically for all the gifts that haven't been all the um, uh, accounted for or chosen, we're going to um, put everybody's names back in the hat or actually and pick new um, select new people and we will get in touch with you. Um, so we can just keep um, moving forward on this. Um, and we'll just uh, email you um, if you get chosen by us um, to receive a gift. I apologize for our a little bit of wackiness here. Now let's give let's give Marty a round of applause for, for our inaugural door prizes. Yeah, I'm so impressed with the random generator, Marty. That's uh, very interesting as a CPA. Fantastic. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, Janine, and everyone else uh, on that one. So I think now we're going to go to the photo entries, uh, creative sustainability in action photo entries. Yeah, um, so we... Uh, this is something that we're trying out new this year is what we asked um, for, um, for the leaders and energy members is to send in uh, just pictures of, of people um, doing action or things that they worked on throughout the year related to sustainability um, and you know being in the community, either home or work or just having fun and um, um, we, we sort of collected a group of pictures, you know, all that we could and, um, and hopefully we'll just continue on doing this, um, every year and, and also putting the pictures on our website. So hope you enjoy it. Um, this is the first of many. Yeah, shout out. This is from Jakey Greer, um, new uh, Leaders in Energy volunteer, uh, developing new products from old products. Yeah, and this, um, I actually took this picture. This was um, one of the first vendors that I saw um, that ran their, um, their power off of solar power. Um, this was at GW. So I random, randomly asked if I could market his his business for him. Um, I think this is about a year ago. And uh, so I'm, I'm pretty excited for this uh, industry and what's to come on this. All right, thank you, Marty, uh, for sharing these wonderful community photos with us. Um, next up, we'll have Janine uh, take the stage again to thank our great sponsors. Janine? Very good. Um, could uh, I, Beth, are you still able to advance the slides? Okay. I'm, Okay, uh, just wanted to thank um, all of our sponsors, uh, primarily um, our, our, our Big Green Shift sponsor and then our clean energy environmental leaders, benefactors, media partners, and um, our leaders in energy team uh, committees and, and attendees. Next slide, please. Um, just this gives you an idea of, of how many people are involved in leaders in energy on our team and um, really doing this. Um, many people have day jobs and, and are doing this on the side as well. So just really appreciate their dedication and everything they're doing on our, our team. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Miriam Axel, just so delighted she earned her doctorate this year. Just everyone is doing so much fantastic work. Next slide, please. Uh, thanks to our advisors. Um, 
just really delighted to, to have you all here uh, helping us. Next slide, please. Uh, wow, did you guys like the show tonight? I mean, uh, it really, uh, it takes quite a bit to put this together, their first virtual event. It's more like a TV show. You could look at all these four gen committees. I mean, just all these people involved in, in this. Uh, thank you, Anne. Um, really do appreciate getting a lot of nice comments here in the chat. Really do uh, appreciate how well this came together and uh, how it really um, was like a TV production and so many people to thank. Uh, but maybe one, uh, well, once I get started, I could be here all night, but just a quick shout out to, to Lara for all the, the wonderful video work that she did to really make it look like a TV production. Um, of course, uh, Beth and, and Gabby, all that are running the technical things. It, it could be a, a long list, but um, just so appreciate everyone here and uh, making our seventh um, award celebration a, a, a wonderful success and uh, everyone really played a, a lot of roles gosh getting so many accolades really 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 appreciate it okay next slide otherwise we'll be here all night and i know we're already past uh, nine o'clock we'd like to maybe see if we can do one more small breakout group for those who would like to stay um, maybe it'll just be me and someone else who knows at this point at nine o'clock. Um, and I just a special shout out for our change maker attendees. These people um, donated, um, you know, a little extra for a ticket. You know, we'd made it free and these people um, donated and, and really do appreciate uh, being a change maker attendee and uh, supporting our mission. So uh, thank you so much to um, these, these individuals. Next slide, please. And thank you to our community for your wonderful support. You know, um, without you guys, we wouldn't be here and we're all in it together. You heard what the awardee said tonight and how we're really trying to, to work to uh, make a, a better world and community. And I hope you like what you saw at Leaders in Energy. We've got a lot of exciting things coming up uh, for 2021. So check out our website and always looking for volunteers. And we got a couple of them here tonight. So uh, just, just let us know. Samuel, is that it for me? Uh, I guess we're going to networking now. Janine, Samuel, Marty, the committee, yay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Who is that, Lara? I think that's Helene. Helene. Yeah. Oh, Helene. Thank you, Helene. I, I so think nice we ought to, to all to unmute you. and give you all a round of applause. Thank oh, you. Oh, well, thank you so <laughs> much. I'm really glad you enjoyed the show. And wow, the awardees were just amazing. And uh, it just really does inspire you to keep going. Truly. Thanks, Brian. Nice job you did tonight. Oh, thank you, Janine. You yeah. bet. You too. Absolutely. As usual. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We have, a, uh, as Janine mentioned, uh, there is an opportunity to jump in on a, a small group sessions. We are running a little bit behind time, but I think they'll, those sessions will be open for folks to uh, pop in and, and do some post, uh, you know, Forgen Awards networking to continue that on for those who, who've had a couple of cocktails and mocktails throughout the night to give them that energy. So um, feel free to join us and, and look out for further future events from Leaders in Energy and stay tuned for the eighth annual Forgen this time next year. Samuel, I like your long-term planning. Wow. <laughs> I wonder if Brian Check was still here to hear you know, that. <laughs> you're proud. So thank you all. Thank you. So we're going to turn it over to Gabby then, I guess now. Yes, we'll okay. we'll let Gabby and Ty uh, take us to the network. For, for whoever time. wants to stay. Yes. For the hardcore, dedicated, uh, passionate people that like to connect. I think your your mic is is not connected. Uh, yeah. And Samuel, you got Sorry a nice job that. too. A lot of accolades for you as well, being the MC. Oh. Nicely done. Thank you, thank you. Great job, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. That was an amazing event. Super inspiring and um, really fun awards. So great job, everyone. Thanks so much. Um, it looks like we still have over 20 people here. So um, if folks are still interested, um, we can do one breakout session and just give us all a chance to process what we um, heard about tonight and meet a few people. 
so the purpose of the breakout groups is really just to connect with each other um, and uh, share inspiration and share about ourselves. So um, I can suggest a couple prompts. I don't know, um, Beth, are you um, still able to um, split people into rooms? Yes, I can do that, Gabby. Uh, give me a moment to, to do that. Thanks so much. Um, folks, when you get into your rooms, we had a, a topic that we had designated for the end of the event. So let me just pull up that real quick. Um, and this is just a suggested topic, so feel free to just chat. But um, what things about the environment do you care about the most? And do you have a favorite book or environmental movie? Um, those can be some fun topics to discuss with each other, and um, we'll probably keep these short, about 10 minutes. Um, when you get the um, one minute left notice, feel free to exchange some contact information, and that'll be it, and the rest of the night is yours. Have a good time. Gabby? Hey. Hi, everyone. 14 um, left, the hardcore. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Wow. This is Lavona. <laughs> Hi, Martin in Colorado. <laughs> I, still, I still had more cocktail to finish. Oh, good. I've got to get some more wine. I have motivation to spend. I switched the coffee. <laughs> and we had a super synchronicity. <laughs> Who's there? Super synchronicity because Jackie's in Colorado with Martin. And she's looking for new ways. To, she's a friend of your daughter's. She's looking for new ways to get hooked up into environmental activism. Love it. So the two of them can hook up in Colorado. Oh, that's exactly what we try to do here. That is fantastic. It's about connections. And Martin, so nice to have you. And um, Lavona was saying, Lavona Grow from our church said that she was connecting with you too tonight. So just fantastic. Hey, Beth, can I ask you one question totally unrelated to the... Um, uh, small groups, is it possible to save the chat? Because I thought the chat tonight was extremely rich. Yes. Observations. I want to see if we can find someone to write a blog article for us based on a recording. Um, Jennifer Scleroux said the students were just really bogged down right now with deadlines and everything, so we couldn't find a volunteer. But I would like to see if we could capture, you know, at least maybe a page article. This was such a you know, wonderful, um, so much um, insights from the awardees. Yes, absolutely. We will definitely save the chat. Yeah. So, um, Gabby, I know we have um, one other breakout group that's a, that was scheduled. Do you want to go ahead with that? What would you like to do? I think we should call it a night, personally. It's pretty late, and I think... What? We You're the young one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. but I, I can leave it. You can continue chatting if you'd like. We don't I'm even need a chat it. group. Now. Pretty... Unmic yourselves and talk to each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is pretty oh, much oh I see. Chat. And then we just stay on Zoom, and then Gabby can, can sign off, and just whoever wants to stay can stay. Okay, that's a nice idea. I have a feeling Beth is about ready to keel over. <laughs> Yeah, I, I need a That's wonderful time. job. Thank you so much with all those videos. Yeah, I mean, wow, we, I think we were all holding our breath. And Elvin, you look so beautiful now that you got the paint <laughs> smudge like, off I, of your camera. I caused the main technical difficulty. I feel bad, like I'm supposedly the visual person. Am I, so I gorgeous. I knew you were doing your hair and then it's like, we can't even see. So I even tried to just lighting and everything. And I, well, my camera has a little flip thing that I turn on and off. I guess while doing that, if I had some hand cream that blurred it and I, <laughs> I thought it was like a camera technical thing. I'm like, is it my computer? I'm like, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so stupid about that. Thank you for the nice shout out. <laughs> Thank you for everything as well. Just everybody, yeah. Janine, well, I'm gonna- Folks, I think I'm gonna sign off, but great job, everyone. Really, really incredible. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you Gabby. Guys. Wonderful Thank job you. on yourself. And I was hearing Martin also uh, chiming in. I think he's getting ready to, to head out. Thank you, Gabby, for everything. Thank you. Everybody Thank you. did a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne, for coming in. Really yes. great to see you as always. Always good, to, always good to see you. I'm going to sign off. Have a Thank great Thank you, Anne, for your support. Yeah. Really, really appreciate it. Happy Bye. holidays.
And same here. I enjoyed it as well. So I'm going to head out here, but I'll hope to catch up with you, Janine. Hey, Martin, um, don't head out quite yet because I did. I was caught by your comment about Peter Saito. You felt that he really encapsulated a lot of the important issues. A lot of us were really impressed with that video. Um, yeah, so. You had some comments what did you also wanna... about Klaus, Klaus Lackner too, didn't you? Oh yeah, Martin, you see, what was your comment about Klaus Lochner about the mineralization of the carbon being kind of a natural cycle? Well, yeah, that's the way mineralization through a limestone in particular has been one of the biggest ways that Earth withdrew carbon from the atmosphere. But, uh, and, and therefore it is one way that we might be able to deal with this as a catastrophic uh, problem, but we've got to, not uh, forget the other variables because we could just look at it as a quick fix and say we can just keep on doing what we're doing mm -hmm. and then we'll succumb to any number of other non-climate change issues. Uh, we've just, we just have to get off the growth kick. That's all there is to it. Wow, Brian Check would love you. You you know Brian, don't you? Well, I've known Brian for a long time, and I was of the mind that we have to get off the growth kick long before I met him, not to say that I've uh, uh, stated it as eloquently as he has, but it is. We, we have to figure out a way to proceed where growth is part of life sometimes, and then it's not other times, because if we are going to be wed to growth for growth's sake, as the measure of success, there's nothing that will um, ultimately keep us from doing ourselves in. Doing ourselves in, yeah. And I thought Saito really um, just expressed that so articulately that we're consuming the planet. Yeah, yeah we are. We are. You guys, um, um, I, I have I, a question though, Mar Martin. Okay, about uh, Beth is, uh, I think, about ready to fall over here. Yeah, I'm going to sign off. So I'm going to pass the, the controls to you, Janine, when I Okay, sign that off. sounds great. Now that I'm a Zoom whiz, just signing up for Leaders in Energy on Zoom this week. <laughs> so I'm going to stop the recording right now, okay? Oh, that's probably a good idea. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay.